nominated to the Northern District of Georgia, Dale Ho, nominated to the Southern District of New York, and Kathy Vidal, nominated to be the Director of the United States Patent and Trademark Office, known as the PTO. A number of our colleagues are here today to formally introduce their nominees, and I'll turn to them very quickly. Before I do, I want to take a few broad observations about the nominees before us. I remarked several times about the diversity of nominees being uh, recommended by the Biden administration. The slate before us continues to represent that professional diversity. Among our judicial nominees today, we have two sitting federal judges, four nominees who've worked in private legal practice, including one as a law firm partner, one nominee who previously served as a federal prosecutor, two who represented indigent criminal defendants, one who previously served as a career law clerk, and one nominee who's dedicated his career to advancing civil rights, including the right to vote. When I speak about professional diversity, I am not lauding diversity for its own sake. I'm instead recognizing that federal prosecutors and corporate lawyers have historically been well represented on the federal bench, and we are working to create some balance. To be absolutely clear, federal prosecutors and corporate lawyers can and do make outstanding judges. We have evidence of that before us today as well. But as leaders across the political and ideological spectrum have noted, it's vital that our federal judiciary reflect the communities it serves. I have little doubt that some of our nominees today will face questions about their record, holding, uh, upholding constitutional rights, ensuring an accurate census, working to make our criminal justice system better. I also anticipate there'll be questions about the nominee's ability to differentiate between their previous responsibilities and roles as advocates and the responsibilities of a judge. I have every confidence that these nominees understand that distinction. I'd also note that during the last administration, we had multiple judicial nominees brought before us who spent their early careers as advocates at conservative legal organizations and for conservative causes. To name just a few, Kyle Duncan, now in the Fifth Circuit, argued against the constitutional right to same-sex marriage and in favor of restricting voting light voting laws in Texas and other states. Matthew Kesmarczyk on the Northern District of Texas spent much of his career at the First Liberty Institute, arguing against marriage equality, equality and challenging key provisions of the Affordable Care Act. Sarah Pitlick, now in the Eastern District of Missouri, defending multiple laws restricting a woman's reproductive freedom. She advocated against reproductive freedom in speeches and publications, well documented. In short, each of these nominees were clearly advocates inside and outside of the courtroom. Yet at the same at the time, my Republican co colleagues stressed that a nominee should not be held to account for advocacy they took as a practicing attorney, whether that was in the form of a brief or an op-ed. In fact, my Republican colleagues repeatedly argued that senators should not oppose President Trump's nominees for any arguments they made in the course of representing their clients. I find it hard to believe that ju Republican judicial nominees can set aside their role as advocates and Democratic nominees cannot. It would be regrettable if my colleagues on the other side of the aisle uh, cast aside the standards they applied to their own nominees just a few short years ago. Before I turn to the ranking member for his opening remarks, I'd like to address an issue that was raised at the last nomination hearing concerning the FBI's reported creation of a new, quote, threat tag, close quote, to track reports of violence and threats of violence against school officials. It's been debated at length in this committee, not formally, but informally. What we find is that the FBI uses tags to track the reports it receives by issue category, which can help determine the scope or region of a particular threat. Perfectly in line with Attorney General Garland's testimony at our recent oversight hearing, where he told this committee that the purpose of their recent mem memorandum about school violence is, quote, for our federal law enforcement to engage with state and local law enforcement and determine whether they need assistance. As to the scope and violence of threats of violence facing public school officials, let me share publicly gathered and published data. ED Week Research Center, an education not-for-profit, recently conducted a survey of educators that found 60% of principals and district leaders surveyed said someone in their district had been verbally or physically threatened in the past year. 60% of these school officials. Regarding that school's, usually school's approach to the COVID-19 pandemic, nearly one in three principals and district leaders said school board members also face threats. 
Administrators noted that even school nurses are facing threats now. Violence and threats of violence are serious. We've seen that played out almost every day of our lives. As I've said before, the First Amendment does not protect violence nor threats of violence. Whether the violence is directed against school officials, airline workers, public health officials, or members of Congress, it is the duty of federal, state, and local law enforcement to respond appropriately. With that, I want to turn to my colleague, yeah. Senator Grassley. Welcome to our nominees. Uh, Judge Stark and Judge Corley have significant judicial experience. I'm hoping to hear more from both of them about how they approach cases and their judicial philosophy. Ms. Vidal uh, also has substantial experience working as an engineer and litigating patent cases. I'm interested to hear what plans she has for the Patent and Trademark Office. Ms. Calvert, Garrity, uh, and Mr. Ho have all worked in advocacy roles Mr. Ho has been particularly outspoken with his criticism of the courts and conservatives. Now, we all know that liberal activists like the Dark Money Group Demand Justice have celebrated judicial nominees who serve as uh, uh, advocates. Uh, Demand Justice advocates expect the nominee to take an activist approach on the bench You've heard me talk about why that means that we on this committee need to closely evaluate uh, this administration's nominees. You've heard me talk about that before, and so I'm not going to repeat those points. So uh, I'm just to uh, say welcome to the committee, everybody, and uh, welcome to your families as well, because I'm sure, uh, like I would be, you'd be very proud of their uh, positions that they've been appointed to. Thanks, Senator Grassley. Uh, a number of colleagues joined us this morning to introduce nominees, and they'll be coming and going, which is perfectly normal because everyone has a busy schedule. But we understand that our colleague, Senator Warnock of Georgia, has a hearing that just starts in a few minutes. So take it away, Senator Warnock. Thank you so very much, Chair Durbin and Ranking uh, Member uh, Grassley for allowing me to appear before the committee. Uh, I am honored uh, to be here to introduce two excellent and highly qualified judicial nominees for the Northern District of Georgia, Sarah Elizabeth Garrity and Victoria Marie Calvert. Ms. Garrity cur currently serves as senior counsel at the Southern Center for Human Rights, a leading public interest organization in the Southeast. Joining her today are her parents, Thomas and Diane, husband Samuel, and daughters Margaret and Rebecca. Ms. Garrity has devoted her career to ensuring equal justice under the law. For nearly two decades, she has led complex litigation at the Southern Center for Human Rights, here's, here's what representing some of the most marginalized members of the community and bringing to light instances where our justice system has failed to live up to its values. Ms. Garrity has, proud, uh, has broad support from the Georgia legal community and law enforcement. One letter from a police officer with over 40 years of experience praises Ms. Garrity for her good character and her commitment to the rule of law. Another from a former opposing counsel attests to her experience, integrity, and leadership. And last year, in recognition of her outstanding work, Ms. Garrity was named Attorney of the Year by the Fulton County Daily Report. I'm also honored to introduce Ms. Calvert, who was joined today by her mother, Jacqueline, her sister, Alex, husband, Max, and son, Hollis. Ms. Calvert is a first-generation American and the first in her family to graduate from college. She would bring a diverse set of experiences to the bench. She is currently a staff attorney, attorney at the Federal Public Defender Program, where she ensures that her clients receive the due process that our Constitution guarantees. She's also worked in the Atlanta firm, the Atlanta law firm, King & Spaulding, where she also maintained a robust pro bono practice. Ms. Calvert, too, has broad support from Georgia's legal community. A letter from a group of current federal prosecutors all of whom Ms. Calvert faced as defense counsel 
praised her civility and professionalism, as well as her keen intellect and legal acumen. Another group of fir former prosecutors who served in Democratic and Republican administrations spoke to her excellent judgment and commitment to public service. Both Ms. Garrity and Ms. Calvert are historic nominees. If confirmed, Ms. Garrity would become the first civil rights attorney, and Ms. Calvert would become only the second black woman and first former federal public defender in the Northern District. Both are highly, are highly qualified, and I look forward to supporting their nominations on the Senate floor. Thank you again for allowing me to appear before this committee to share uh, my enthusiastic support for both of these nominees. Thank you, Senator Warnock. And on cue, the arrival of our Majority Leader, Senator Schumer. Hello. Welcome back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, it's good to be back in this room where I spent many, many happy years, and we got some great things done, so I thank you. And I want to thank you and Ranking Member Grassley, all my colleagues on Senate Judiciary. Um, and today it's my honor to introduce a nominee for the District Court for the Southern District of New York, Dale Ho. He's an esteemed litigator and one of the foremost election lawyers in the country, whom I was so proud to recommend to President Biden. Dale's life, his family, where's Dale's family? Stand up so we can say hello to you. Thank you. Nice family. Um, uh, and his career is a shining example of the American dream. He's the grandson of a World War II veteran. His parents grew up in the Philippines before immigrating to the United States. Though Dale grew up in San Jose, which I hear is much nicer than DC this time of year, he was always keenly aware, even as a kid, where his parents came from and frankly, what they escaped from, a country where power rested not in the people, but in the whims of one leader. That thought, as Mr. Ho will tell you, was the spark that began his love for democracy and for democratic institutions. And today, Dale sits before this committee as one of the nation's leading experts on election law and on voting rights. His credentials speak for themselves, he graduated from Princeton, Yale Law School, clerked for two judges, including in the same district court for which he has now been nominated. But it has been his experience at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund at the, and at the ACLU, where he currently serves as the director of the Voting Rights Project, where Mr. Ho has set himself apart as one of the best lawyers in America. He argued two cases before the United States Supreme Court, Trump versus New York, challenging the exclusion of undocumented immigrants from the population used to apportion the census in the House of Representatives, and the Department of Commerce versus New York, successfully challenging the inclusion of the citizenship question on the 2020 census. That's a case we'd all heard about and many of us exalted in, and it was only because of Dale Ho's great work, I think, that we succeeded. He, he did an amazing job. He also served as the lead counsel in Fish and Co Fish versus Kobach, successfully challenging a Kansas law, requiring people to show a birth certificate or a passport when registering to vote. And as those who have worked with Mr. Ho over the years will attest to, it's not just his experience, but his excellence as a legal thinker that makes Mr. Ho stand out. He is regarded by his colleagues as one of the finest lawyers in the country, whose work on voting rights is historic in nature. One judge who presided over a case Mr. Ho argued described him as one of the most compelling litigators who has ever been before him. And if confirmed, I have no doubt, Mr. Ho will make an excellent federal judge. My colleagues, our courts desperately need more people like Dale Ho. Across the country, we are witnessing the greatest assault on voting rights that we have seen since Jim Crow. As voting rights come under assault across the country, it is only fitting that we elevate one of the country's top voting rights experts to safeguard our democracy and preserve our fundamental rights as US citizens. 
Finally, if confirmed, Mr. Ho would also add to the range of experiences, backgrounds, and perspectives that I believe the courts desperately need. I'm proud that the Senate is not only increasing the demographic diversity on the bench, more women, more people of color, more immigrants from, more individuals from immigrant families, but it's also, it's professional diversity as well. Voting rights lawyers, civil rights lawyers, public defenders, and more. This is how we strengthen the public trust in the judiciary. The country isn't all corporate lawyers and prosecutors. It has many other people in the legal profession. And now we're beginning to see them on the bench in much greater numbers. Mr. Ho's confirmation would go a long way to helping achieve that goal. So I'm proud to support Dale Ho's nomination today, and I thank the members of this committee for letting me speak in his favor. Thank you, Senator Schumer, for your testimony before the committee. Uh, Senator Ossoff, since Senator Warnock opened uh, relating to Georgia nominees, would you like to speak at this moment? Thank you, Chair Durbin. Thank you, Ranking Member Grassley and colleagues on the committee. It's my honor to introduce our two highly qualified nominees to the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Georgia, Sarah Garrity and Victoria Calvert. Senator Reverend Warnock and I are grateful for the service of the Federal Nominations Advisory Commission we formed, and in particular, Judge Leah Ward Sears, the former Chief Justice of Georgia's Supreme Court, for her leadership of that advisory commission. Turning to our nominees, Ms. Garrity is joined today by her husband, Sam Gratzer, a physician, and her children, Margaret and Rebecca. Ms. Garrity's training and experience demonstrate her high qualification and lifetime of preparation to serve on the federal bench. She excelled at the University of Michigan, where she received both her JD and a Master of Social Work, went on to clerk for Judge, Judge James B. Zagel on the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Illinois, and then went to work as a staff attorney with the Office of the Appellate Defender in New York. For nearly two decades, Ms. Garrity has worked at the Atlanta-based Sovereign Center for Human Rights and has served as a litigator in state and federal court as well as in the state of Alabama. She has served as counsel in civil, criminal, habeas corpus, immigration, family law, and many other cases. She has extensive experience with federal district court litigation, having handled a range of complex matters, including serving as lead counsel in certified class actions, leading litigation teams in complex evidentiary hearings, and building consensus with government officials to remedy unlawful government policies and prison conditions. She has sought to uphold the Constitution and the rule of law on behalf of indigent persons in the criminal justice system and has consistently impressed both her colleagues and her adversaries in the courtroom by embodying the qualities necessary to serve on the federal bench. Donald Verrilli, former Solicitor General with 35 years of experience litigating in federal court, describes Ms. Garrity as, quote, brilliant and careful lawyer who is in no sense an ideologue and will give every party who appears before her a fair shake. Given Ms. Garrity's professional experience and the extraordinary nature of her work as an advocate, Ms. Garrity is deeply familiar with all of the different aspects of the day-to-day -day practice of law. She's a seasoned litigator with a deep work ethic and a demonstrated commitment to equal justice under the law, and I look forward to her testimony today. Next, Mr. Chairman, it's my honor to introduce the second nominee for the District Court of the Northern District of Georgia, Victoria Calvert along with her husband, Max, and their son, Hollis. Although born in New York, Georgia is proud to claim Ms. Calvert as one of her own. As she spent the majority of her childhood in Chambly, Georgia, not far from where my folks live, and her entire professional career in the Atlanta area. Ms. Calvert earned her undergraduate degree in political science and Spanish from Duke University, went on to earn her law degree from New York University School of Law, and Ms. Calvert's experience in both civil and criminal law have prepared her to handle the caseload of a district court judge. She began her legal career as an associate at one of the largest and most well-respected international law firms, Atlanta-based King & Spalding, where she worked for six years on their Special Matters and Investigations Practice Group under current FBI Director Christopher Wray. While in private practice, Ms. Calvert devoted hundreds of hours to pro bono work, earning her firm's pro bono service award on several occasions. This strong commitment to community led Ms. Calvert to accept a position as a federal public defender in the Northern District of Georgia, where she represented people from every walk of life, including in complex pretrial motions, trial work, and appeals at the 11th Circuit. 
In a letter supporting her nomination, more than a dozen prosecutors in the U.S. Attorney's Office of the Northern District commended Ms. Calvert for her, quote, unfailing display of civility and professionalism inside and outside the courtroom, end quote, as well as her, quote, keen intellect and legal acumen. The president of the Georgia Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers noted that Ms. Calvert has, quote, both the temperament and desire to treat everyone who will appear before her with equal respect, dignity, and fairness. I hope my colleagues will join me in supporting both of these eminently qualified and impressive nominees who have demonstrated a lifetime of commitment to the law, to equal justice, and I look forward to hearing from them and the rest of the panel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Rossoff. Our first uh, panel is going to consist of the uh, Circuit Court nominee, Judge Stark, and uh, speaking on his behalf are both senators from uh, the state of Delaware, and we'll start with uh, the Honorable Thomas Carper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and members of the committee, and uh, my colleague, uh, Senator, Senator Coons. Uh, thank you, uh, 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 Mr. Chairman, and uh, to our ranking member, uh, Senator Grassley, um, and the members of the committee for inviting us today to introduce Judge Len Stark to his confirmation hearing to serve as a judge on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. Eleven years ago, I had the privilege to, uh, to sit here and to give similar remarks before this very committee to introduce Judge Stark then a nominee to be a U.S. District Court Judge for Delaware. We have four of them. He was nominated for one of those seats and held it uh, with, uh, with great uh, com capability. During his uh, 2010 nomination hearing, uh, Len was joined by his, uh, his wife, uh, Beth, their uh, three children, Brennan, Lucy, and Jamie, his mom, Linda, and sister, Danielle. I'm glad to see all of them here uh, with us today, and they were joined by Len's mother-in-law, Karen Lee Abrafi. Uh, also known as Karen Lee Brophy. Uh, but there is notably one person who joined us in uh, 2010 who's not with us today to commemorate uh, Lynn's nomination. That person is Jim Souls, one known well by both uh, Senator Coons and me. Jim was a legendary political science, beloved political science professor emeritus at the University of Delaware, who mentored many folks, including Judge Stark and me. Jim Souls was a personal hero to many of us in Delaware, and I know he is smiling down on this hearing today. Len Stark, uh, like uh, Jim and myself as a fellow University of Delaware graduate of Fighting Blue Hen at U of D, uh, Judge uh, Len Stark uh, double majored as an undergraduate in political science and economics, who while simultaneously also uh, getting his earnings master's degree. And during college, uh, Len proved himself to be an exceptional student and person, uh, earning a full scholarship as a Eugene DuPont Memorial Distinguished Scholar. Not long after graduation, Lynn was selected to be a Rhodes Scholar. He studied at Oxford University and authored numerous academic, ac academic and scholar uh, publications, including a book on British politics, which he wrote in his spare time between classes at Oxford. After Oxford, Lynn uh, went on to earn his law degree at Yale Law School, uh, where he served as editor, senior editor of the Yale Law Journal and then began his career in public service as an assistant U.S. attorney for Delaware, where from 2002 to until 2007, he handled a wide variety of federal, criminal, and civil matters. Before his current position as a district judge, Lynn served as a magistrate judge on the U.S. District uh, Court of Delaware. And it was this role that prepared him, I think, quite well to serve as a district uh, court judge. Only four years after serving as a district judge, in 2014, Lynn uh, was appointed to the position of chief judge uh, which he held uh, up until, I think, June of this year. Uh, during his 14 years on the bench in Delaware, Judge Stark has presided over 6,000 civil and uh, criminal cases, including 2,400 patent cases and 93 trials, including 63 patent trials. Patent law is of particular importance to the federal circuit, and Judge Stark's experience and expertise in these matters makes him uniquely qualified for this uh, judgeship. Finally, Mr. Chairman, colleagues, he, I want to remind our colleagues here today that in 2010, Judge Stark was confirmed by the full Senate by unanimous consent. Judge Stark is known as a consensus builder who works to find principal compromises. In fact, of Judge Stark's approximately 2,100 written opinions, only 2% have ever been reversed or affirmed with criticism. In the years since Judge Stark's last confirmation by this committee, Judge Stark has served in Delaware and the nation with integrity and with distinction. He has the heart of a servant and the temperament to be an outstanding judge on the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals of the Federal Circuit. 
and I look forward to a swift confirmation so we can hopefully confirm Judge Stark without delay. Let me just say, as a, a recovering governor, I had the opportunity to nominate uh, dozens, scores of uh, men and women to serve on the judiciary of the state of Delaware. And I always look for people who had the heart of a servant, people who understand the, the idea that you're supposed to treat people with dignity and respect in the, in the courtroom, look for people who are really bright and they really knew the law and were able to make tough decisions. Uh, nobody meets that, uh, that's, uh, those description, that description better than Lynn Stark, and I'm honored and proud to be here uh, in front of his uh, family and with him and with all of you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Senator Carper. It's high praise. Thank and you. I turn now to your colleague, Senator Coons. Thank you, Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Grassley. Uh, good morning. I want to congratulate all of today's uh, nominees. Um, I am especially pleased to join my senior senator in introducing a nominee I've literally known for decades, uh, a fellow Delawarean, uh, a talented and seasoned jurist, someone who has the experience, the intellect, intellect and the temperament to continue his service as an outstanding federal judge. Uh, today, he is nominated to serve on the federal circuit. This is Judge Len Stark, of whom both Senator Carper and I are speaking. Um, I've known him and his wife, Beth, for many years, uh, and they are a classic Delaware story. They met um, their first day as freshmen at the University of Delaware, um, and as they say, the rest is history. As Senator Carper has shared, Dr. Jim Soles, known to all of us as a legend uh, in the political science department, played some small role in inspiring Len towards service. Um, he is um, supported today, as he is always, by his um, wonderful family, um, Brennan and uh, Jamie and Lucy, um, Beth and Linda and Danielle and others you may introduce, Your Honor. Uh, he also is joined today uh, by his clerks. Um, his tremendous experience as a trial judge in the District of Delaware makes him spectacularly qualified for this particular nomination and role. His 14-year career as a federal jurist began as a magistrate in 2007. In 2010, he became a district court judge, being confirmed unanimously by the Senate and he served as chief judge since 2014. Um, he served um, as the presiding judge over 6,000 criminal and civil trials, including 2,400 patent cases. The District of Delaware is literally one of the busiest patent courts in the country, um, and he has been reversed, uh, as you heard, in just 2% of the 2,100 written opinions he's delivered. Um, and frankly, he's already shown that he will hit the ground running as a federal circuit court judge, having sat by designation 54 times already on the Third Circuit and the Federal Circuit. Um, his academic and professional credentials before joining the federal judiciary confirm uh, why President Biden um, sought his um, service on this important and prestigious position. He's not just a proud fighting blue hen, a UD graduate. Uh, where he earned a bachelor's degree in political science with honors and a bachelor of science with a distinction in economics, but he had a minor in women's studies, and his master's degree was in European medieval and early modern history. Just a reminder of the broad and searching intellect he has brought to his service on the bench. As a Rhodes Scholar, he studied at Oxford, uh, where he earned a doctorate in philosophy and British politics, and then graduated uh, from a law school some of us have heard of, Yale Law School, in 1996. He clerked for Judge Stapleton on the Third Circuit, practiced with Skadden Arps for a number of years, and then entered public service as an assistant U.S. attorney where he delivered excellent service uh, in the support of the U.S. attorney. Um, I am confident he will bring the same sort of open-mindedness, keen legal mind, outstanding character, and sterling work ethic to the circuit court that he's brought to his practice and to the District of Delaware bench. I strongly support him, and I join my senior senator in urging all of our colleagues to take up and swiftly confirm this outstanding nominee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Coons. On behalf of our California nominees, I'm going to recognize uh, Senator Feinstein and Senator Padilla. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'm very pleased to introduce two nominees from the state of California. Jacqueline Corley has been nominated to serve as a judge on the United States District Court for the Northern District of California, and Kathy Vidal has been nominated to lead the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Both, as you might expect, are highly qualified for the positions to which they have been nominated. Ms. Vidal, excuse me, Jacqueline Corley graduated from the University of California at Berkeley, received her law degree from Harvard. Judge Corley has spent more than 20 years serving the Northern District, first as a career lawyer clerk for Judge Charles Breyer, and most recently as a magistrate judge. 
As a magistrate judge, she's handled a wide variety of civil and criminal cases. She's presided over more than two dozen cases that have gone to a verdict or judgment following trial, including a number of jury trials. She has shown herself to be fair, thoughtful, a judge who will be able to hit the ground running if she is confirmed to the Northern District. Next, President Biden has nominated Kathy Vidal to head the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, an important office. She graduated from Binghamton University. She holds a Master's in Electrical Engineering from Syracuse and a JD from the University of Pennsylvania. She clerked on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit and has spent 25 years as an intellectual property litigator in private practice. I think that's interesting. Since 2017, she has served as the managing partner of Winston and Strawn's Silicon Valley office in my home state of California. It's very clear to me that she has a very deep knowledge of intellectual property law and the important work conducted by the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. And so this expertise will help her serve well if confirmed. So I thank you very much for this, Mr. Chairman, and Senator Grassley as well. Thank you both. Thanks, Senator Feinstein, of course, and Senator Padilla. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman, and Ranking Member Grassley for his earlier comments, uh, complimenting the two nominees from California as well. It's my honor to also introduce and welcome these outstanding Californians to the committee this morning. I'll speak first uh, about uh, Kathy Vidal, uh, here today with her sons, Liam and Trey, uh, her mother, Fran, her sister, Christy, and other loved ones. As uh, Senator Feinstein recognized, she's been nominated by President Biden to serve as the Under Secretary of Commerce for Intellectual Property and Director of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. She's one of the leading intellectual property lawyers in the country and has held key leadership and management roles in international law firms. Uh, she is nationally recognized for leading high-profile patent disputes. Her experience covers a myriad of complex technologies from semiconductors and software to medical devices and consumer products. Uh, Ms. Vidal has numerous accolades for her work, has received numerous accolades for her work, including being inducted as a fellow by Litigation Council of America, a trial lawyer honorary society. In addition to her legal expertise, Ms. Vidal also has a strong technical background, having practiced in industry for five years in circuits, systems, software, and artificial intelligence. She received her bachelor's and master's degree in electrical engineering and completed the GE Edison Engineering three-year leadership program. I think a technical background particularly in this era of constant innovation as it pertains to patent and trademarks is particularly timely and helpful. If confirmed, Ms. Vidal would be only the second woman director of the PTO. With her background as an engineer and a patent lawyer, Ms. Vidal is no stranger to diversity and inclusion challenges in our innovation ecosystem. In private practice, Ms. Vidal has championed efforts to improve the diversity of law firms, especially at the intersection of law, technology, and regulatory policy. She's also founded the Next Generation Lawyers Initiative to advocate for training and opportunities for junior lawyers. Throughout her career, Ms. Vidal has developed a reputation for thoughtful and insightful decision-making and I know that these qualities will serve her well as director of the PTO, and I look forward to hearing from her today. Next, I'm also uh, honored to speak in favor of Judge Jacqueline Corley, who is here with her husband, Douglas, daughter, Morgan, and son, Nathaniel. Uh, Judge Corley is a longtime public servant with deep California roots, born and raised in Long Beach, California. She's earned her bachelor's degree uh, and her JD. Uh, Judge Corley's pathway to the bench has been non-traditional. I think that's a good thing. Uh, after some time in private practice, she did spend more than 10 years as a career law clerk for Judge Charles Breyer in the Northern District of California. 
based on her meticulous and fair-minded work in that role and the expertise she demonstrated in private practice, Judge Corley was selected to serve as a magistrate judge for the Northern District. There, she spent the past decade presiding over a range of both criminal and civil cases with skill and with fairness. Judge Corley's record demonstrates not only her legal acumen, but her commitment to serving others. She's a dedicated mentor for the law clerks of the Northern District and a former volunteer mediator for California's Alternative Dispute Resolution Panel. Judge Corley also helps oversee the Alternatives to Incarceration Program in the Northern District, which helps participants to access addiction treatment and find stable employment. I'm confident that Judge Corley will uphold this commitment to equal justice as a member of the Northern District Bench, and I look forward to hearing the testimony of both of these fine nominees. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks very much, Senator Padilla, and thanks to all of our colleagues and members of the committee for their uh, testimony. The first panel consists of uh, Judge Leonard Stark. Judge, if you'll approach the table and take the oath, do you affirm the testimony you're about to give before the committee? Be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Let the record reflect that the judge, thank goodness, answered in the affirmative, and you may now proceed. Thank you very much, Chairman Durbin and Ranking Member Grassley for scheduling this hearing. I want to thank uh, my home state senators, Senator Carper and Senator Coons, for their very generous introduction of me this morning and for their support of me throughout this process. I'm grateful to President Biden for the great honor of this nomination. It's a special privilege to be the first Delawarean to be nominated to the Federal Circuit and to be nominated by the first Delawarean to be president. I uh, would like to introduce, if I could, my family who are here to support me, uh, my wife, Beth. Uh, as you heard, Beth and I met on the first day of classes at the University of Delaware. She's been my best friend ever since then, and we've now been married for 27 years. Together, we've raised three kids. Uh, they're all here with me today. My son, Brennan, lives in Texas, where he's an entrepreneur. My daughter, Lucy, is a college student in Toronto, and my younger son, Jamie, is a high school student in Delaware. Also with us are three uh, women who mean the world to me. My mother, Linda Stark, is here from Arizona. My sister, Danielle Gordman, is here from Nebraska. And my mother-in-law, Karen Lee Brophy, is here from Pennsylvania. My three current law clerks are with us as well. Uh, Lee Zhang, Caroline Holliday, and Gary Fox. Uh, they represent the 35 outstanding uh, lawyers who I've been privileged to have as my law clerks over my 14 years as a federal judge. And finally, I'd like to recognize my father, Walter Stark, who passed away in 2003, and my father-in-law, Jim Brophy, who passed away in 2015. Um, my father was the first lawyer that I ever knew, and while he did not live long enough to see me become a judge, I know in my heart how proud he is of me. My father-in-law, Jim, uh, was here with me when I was in this very room before this committee in 2010, and so today I am feeling uh, his physical absence more than even every other day. But thank you again to the committee for considering my nomination, and I look forward to your questions. Judge Stark, what a career. Uh, you've served uh, for 10 or 11 years as district court judge, first starting as magistrate, I might add, and then as district court judge and chief judge. Uh, and now aspiring to this new level, this appointment. Um, you joined with two other former law clerks in a tribute to Judge Walter Stapleton in the uh, Delaware Law Review, focusing on his judicial philosophy. And of course, he played a key role in one of the landmark cases, which is remembered today especially. Would you like to comment on why you thought that judge deserved special recognition? Well, thank you very much for the question, Chairman Durbin. Uh, it was uh, the best possible way to start my career to clerk for Judge Stapleton on the Third Circuit Court of Appeals. He taught me and all of his law clerks the importance of carefully understanding the binding precedents uh, of the Supreme Court, and in his case, the Third Circuit, and uh, working as hard as possible to understand the record that was before us and applying uh, those precedents to the record before us and keeping very focused on only the issues that were presented to the court and to writing with clarity 
to try to give guidance uh, to the district courts. You said uh, in the article that you co-wrote, Judge Stapleton does not, however, read text in isolation, and thus is not a textualist in the narrow sense identified by some, perhaps uh, referring then to Judge Scalia. In both statutory and contractual cases, he reads text contextually and where there is ambiguity in light of the relevant history, pardon me, relevant legislative or bargaining history. Would you like to expound on that a moment? Well, thank you, uh, Senator. In handling uh, more than 6,000 cases over my time as a federal judge and having written more than 2,000 opinions, it's quite frequent that I'm asked to interpret uh, the constitutional uh, provision or statutory provision. I always follow the same process. I start with the text. If the text is unambiguous and it answers the question, that is the end of the analysis. If there is ambiguity, I then look to binding precedent from the Supreme Court and from the Court of Appeals. If that still does not answer the question, I will look to other circuits that are not binding on me and even to persuasive opinions from district court judges. If all of that does not answer the question, then I will turn to other canons of statutory construction and that could include consideration of legislative history. So that's the process I follow and I would follow the same process if fortunate enough to be confirmed to the Court of Appeals. And occasionally a reference to a recording artist? <laughs> Thank you, uh, Senator, for that question. I'm not sure that I've made any reference to recording artists in any of my writings, at Thank least you. my writings as a judge. Senator Grassley. Congratulations, Judge. Uh, I'm going to start with your relationship with Stapleton again. Uh, you wrote a Delaware Law Review article. The article praised the judicial philosophy of Stapleton. You talked for him. In your article, you describe Judge Stapleton as carefully working through the Supreme Court previous decisions and opinions. Uh, the fact that he doesn't make up the law, he tries to find the law set by the Supreme Court. I'm hoping that you'll give, we'll talk a little bit as you already have done about your judicial philosophy. And I'm wondering if you take the same approach as Judge Stapleton or if your approach is somewhat different. Well, thank you very much for the question, Ranking Member Grassley. I learned a great deal from Judge Stapleton, including the process that I have outlined of how I have approached things as a district court judge and how I would continue to approach things if confirmed to the Court of Appeals. It's a careful focus and a lot of diligent hard work, I should add, to understand the binding precedent, to understand the record in trial court, of course, I'm part of making that record, but if confirmed to the Court of Appeals, my job would be to review the record that's already been made and then to apply that binding precedential law to the record before me, focused only on the issue that is presented. I want to go to the case that you were involved in, Barks versus First Correctional Medical. Uh, in this case, uh, Christopher Barks was being held in a correctional institution he committed suicide while he was being held, and his estate sued. You ruled that qualified immunity did not apply because Mr. Barks had a clearly established constitutional right to adequate medical care. The Supreme Court implied that the right at issue had to be defined more narrowly. The court noted that, quote, no decision of this court even discusses suicide screening or prevention protocol, end of quote. Question, with that background, would you explain how you understood the Supreme Court's approach to determine whether a right is clearly established in a qualified immunity case? Thank you, uh, Senator, for the question. Um, uh, you have outlined the facts uh, as I recall them as well. Um, uh, the case went up to the Third Circuit. The Third Circuit Court of Appeals affirmed me, I think, in a two-to-one decision. And as you've indicated, the Supreme Court then reversed the Third Circuit. Uh, I did my very best to understand what Supreme Court precedent was at the time on qualified immunity and to carefully apply Third Circuit precedent. The Third Circuit thought I got that right, and the Supreme Court had the right, of course, uh, to disagree with the Third Circuit, and they did. Uh your, my last question to you would be from a George Mason Law Review article. 
Your article discussed how parties run primary elections. You argued that the equal protection is violated in a primary race when uh, a political party irrationally distinguishes between its candidates. You also wrote that the state should not assist two particular parties at the expense of the other party. Could you please explain your reasoning on how party violates the constitutional equal protection of, uh, of the law clause? Well, thank you for that question, Senator. You're referring to work that I did when I was a law student uh, and wrote an article uh, about the topics uh, that you have referenced. I think, if I recall correctly, and it's been uh, 25 years since I wrote the article um, and sometimes since I looked at it, I think it was a, a, something of a thought experiment. Uh, I had done work as an undergraduate uh, student on the presidential nomination contest, and so I was interested in law school and understanding the legal regime behind presidential nominations, and I think I was exploring whether or not arguments could be made uh, either for or against the constitutionality of the process. Thank you. I yield back. Thanks, Senator Grassley. Senator Leahy. Thank you very much, Judge. Good to see you. Um, I've always had an interest in the uh, federal circuit, and I have a particular interest in appeals from the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office because that's about a third of the appeals, I believe, that go to the Federal Circuit. Under the Leahy Smith American Vents Act, the PTO reviews the patent, and neither party is dissatisfied with the results of At the end of the proceeding, they can appeal to the Federal Circuit. But it seems, look at these cases, as though the Federal Circuit has increasingly raised the bar for Article Three standing for inter-parties uh, review petitioners, and I worry that that's making it more difficult for judicial review. Do you agree uh, that judicial review is important and both sides should have a chance to seek judicial review before either one can be stopped from future arguments on the same issue? Uh, thank you, Senator Leahy, for the question. Uh, after the passage of the America Events Act in 2011, uh, we have seen uh, great uh, the creation, of course, of inter partes review and a, and a tremendous number of them. The way that impacts uh, district court litigation uh, is often uh, there's a request for a stay of a district court case pending uh, the completion of an IPR. Sometimes at claim construction, we're asked to consider constructions uh, that the Patent Trial and Appeals Board have uh, come up with. And at a jury trial, we're often asked uh, either to tell the jury about the IPR process or not to tell them about the IPR process. In all instances, when an issue related to the PTAB comes before me, I apply the law uh, to the specific facts of the case in front of me. I, I worry because I, I worry that the patent system may be uh, misused, for example, one quarter, one quarter of the nation's patent cases have been filed in the Western District of Texas in front of just one judge. In other words, you had 600 district judges, a quarter of the cases are, set, are filed before one judge. It looks like they're actively seeking patent litigation. Does this raise any issues in your mind? Uh, thank you, uh, Senator. You're referring to the issues related to patent venue. I see patent venue disputes regularly in the District of Delaware, and in each case, I take each case as it comes, focus on the specifics of the case before me, and I apply the law uh, to the facts of uh, those ca that, that case. <clears throat> That's not quite answering my question, but I understand, uh, I, I understand what you're saying. Uh, you know, I was here when we created the Federal Circuit. I've known a number of the Federal Circuit uh, judges quite well. I keep in touch with some who have taken senior status, like Judge, Judge Richard Lynn, who's a close friend. Um, but I worry that sometimes in the Federal Circuit, 
more than other courts of appeals. Outcomes can be widely influenced based on who's on the panel. Uh, would you work with others to make sure that you have some predictability out of the uh, Federal Circuit? Because if we don't have some idea of predictability, I think the Federal Circuit is not serving its purpose. Thank you, uh, Senator. And I should say, uh, of course, I don't make policy. Uh, this body can. And these are important questions, and I'm glad that you are asking them. But of course, as a sitting federal judge and a nominee for another federal judgeship, uh, I'm bound by the canons of uh, judicial uh, conduct. But I certainly uh, would look forward, if I'm fortunate enough to be confirmed, to work with my new colleagues uh, to uh, carefully apply the law and to provide in any opinion that I'm part of as clear a guidance as I am capable of uh, to district court judges and the other tribunals that the Federal Circuit reviews. Well, I, I understand the complexity of patent law. But I also understand the difficulty if you do, do not have some predictability uh, or conversely, if you have predictability just for certain parties. And I, I know that's something you'd be concerned about. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Leahy. Senator Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Judge. Congratulations. Um, what, what, what was your DPhil thesis? Uh, thank you, Senator Kennedy, for the question. You're I, welcome. <laughs> I, uh, I wrote about uh, British Party leadership elections from 1963 to 1993. Did you, did, you, uh, did, did you do it in three years, two years? How long did it take you? Senator, my, my then longtime girlfriend, who I'm proud to say is now my wife, uh, was in graduate school in New York. So I wrote it in two years and proposed to her the day I uh, finished at Oxford. Mm -hmm. did, you, did you live? You were at Maudlin? Yes, I was at Malden College. Yeah, did you live in the college, or did you? My first year, no, I, I, uh, my first year I lived on, uh, on Longwall Street, yeah. 5 Longwall. Yeah. And uh, my second year I lived in the Daubney Building overlooking the Oxford Botanical Gardens. It was a beautiful place to write a thesis. Yeah, I bet. Um, explain, Judge, the, the Chevron Doctrine to me. Well, thank you, uh, Senator Kennedy. You're welcome. <laughs> The, uh, the Chevron Doctrine is a, is a doctrine uh, by which uh, federal courts uh, give a certain amount of deference uh, to an agency interpretation of a statute if, uh, if the uh, uh, interpretation of the agency is, um, is ambiguous, uh, federal courts will generally uh, defer to that interpretation. Are, are there any uh, exceptions to that deference? Um, Thank you, Senator. I believe that uh, binding case law does recognize some exceptions. Uh, whenever I have an issue related to any type of deference, I carefully study the law and apply it to the facts of the case before me. Okay. I, I want to get your thoughts on this concept of ambiguity, because you raised it uh, earlier when you were talking about your judicial philosophy. Um, and I'm really interested in your thoughts on this. Don't you think the concept of ambiguity is ambiguous? Uh, I mean, what does it mean? Uh, thank you, Senator. I think the binding case law talks of ambiguity in the sense of if uh, more than one reasonable conclusion could be reached on the question that is pending uh, before the body. Well, this is what I'm getting at, Judge. Does it have to be... 51% ambiguous or really ambiguous, like 80%? What if you look at it and you go, I think I know what they mean. So I guess I'd give it a 40% a ambiguous. How much should it, what, what, how do judges approach that? How do you approach it? Thank you. Uh, so I'm not all that great at math, uh, as you may have understood from the things that I've studied. Um, so I don't approach it with any mathematical precision, and I don't believe that the case law of the Supreme Court or the courts of appeals require me to approach it uh, with any type of mathematical certainty. Of course, as you know, um, 
I don't just uh, decide the issues I want to decide. Parties bring actual concrete disputes before me. They write briefs, they cite to cases, and they make certain arguments. And so I get very focused on the case law, the arguments the parties make, and apply all of that to the facts of the case before me. And through that process, make a determination in a particular case whether a statute is ambiguous. What, what, what kind of guidance has the United States Supreme Court uh, given our, our lower courts on the definition of ambiguous? Senator, as I sit here, I'm not uh, sure. I can't think of any particular precedent as I sit here, but in the more than 2,000 opinions I've uh, written, uh, I'm sure that I've cited whatever the binding Supreme Court precedent is on that question, as well as the binding precedent of the Third Circuit. And if confirmed, I would continue to faithfully and diligently apply uh, binding precedent. Okay. I'm going, I've only got 15 seconds. I'm going to land this plane early. <laughs> Thank you, Judge. Thank you very much, Senator Kennedy. And Senator Coons is now recognized. Thank you, Chairman Durbin. Um, Your Honor, it's great to be with you. Um, great to be with you and your family and your friends and to have a chance to um, both introduce you now question for a few minutes. You have been nominated by our president to um, fill the vacancy created by uh, the departure of the Honorable Kathleen O'Malley. Um, she made great contributions uh, while on the federal circuit bench, um, and in particular, um, I think some of her contributions to the federal circuit uh, came from her previous experience as a district court judge. Uh, she was the only active judge on the federal circuit with that experience, and I, I think the perspective of a district court judge is important uh, among the many insights that various members of that bench uh, bring to their work you would be uniquely positioned to continue that insight through your service of 14 years as a trial judge. You've presided over 2,400, 2,400 patent cases, uh, the subject matter most frequently heard by the Federal Circuit, making that experience particularly relevant. So please just speak with us for a few minutes, if you would, about your experience as a patent trial judge and your views on that relevance to your, um, I hope for, likely, service on the Federal Circuit. Thank you, Senator Coons, very much uh, for that question. As you know, we uh, always get a lot of patent cases in Delaware, and so I've had the good fortune of handling about 2,400 patent cases uh, to date. That includes 63 patent cases that have gone to trial, and while Judge O'Malley's uh, retirement will leave a, a, a huge hole on the federal circuit, I think that my experience with all of those patent cases and patent trials will help me at least uh, try to fill some of, uh, of that. Um, I think particularly I will bring with me a recognition of how challenging it is to put together a reviewable record in a patent case. The technology is always complex. The facts are very uh, challenging. Uh, and also, as you may know, patent uh, litigators often uh, disagree uh, with each other. And so I estimate in a typical patent case that goes all the way to trial, I make many hundreds of decisions or even more than a thousand decisions. Typically only a handful of those issues will ever uh, get appealed to the federal circuit. And so I think I would bring with me an understanding of the context in which those appellate issues arise. I think this will also make me uh, someone who adheres strictly to the applicable standard of review and uh, cause me to strive as best as I can to provide clear guidance in written opinions uh, that I would write. Well, thank you. Um, you're joined by your family and uh, clerks today. Uh, one of the things that I know in the Delaware uh, Bar you are well known for is your sort of family approach. Uh, your uh, reasonable and welcoming and balanced and um, collaborative approach. Uh, Senator Leahy asked you a question about how will you work uh, if confirmed with other members of the federal circuit. Um, one particular example I'm mindful of is you and then Judge Robinson uh, convened a patent study group to look at um, how to streamline the litigation process to curb litigation abuses and to um, deliver outcomes in a more predictable and regular way. Just take a moment, if you would, uh, and talk with us about your approach to being um, both a district court judge but also a colleague. 
Well, thank you very much for that, uh, Senator Coons. Uh, we're fortunate in, in Delaware to have a very collegial bench, and I have sat by uh, designation as a visiting judge with the Federal Circuit as well as with the Third Circuit, and both of those courts place a high premium on collegiality as well. And uh, I would look forward to uh, uh, being uh, collegial and, and working hard on the difficult issues that the Federal Circuit has uh, before it and uh, working together to, to um, you know, uh, apply the law faithfully to the facts before the court. Thank you, Your Honor. In, in my view, your, your unique experience as a district court judge in one of the busiest patent courts in America uh, makes you the best possible nominee for this vacancy on the federal circuit, and I hope my colleagues uh, will join me in quickly confirming you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Kuhn. Senator Blackburn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and Judge, thank you for your time today. We appreciate this, as we do all the nominees that are here. Um, let me ask you this. Does the Constitution allow the government to forbid religion in the public square? Uh, thank you, Senator Blackburn, for that uh, question. Um, uh, the First Amendment, of course, protects the right to okay. uh, free exercise uh, and also has uh, limits uh, the Establishment Clause as well. So how would you define unconstitutional viewpoint discrimination under the First Amendment? Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, if I'm faced with an issue related to the First Amendment, uh, I carefully study the Supreme Court precedent and uh, the circuit precedent, binding circuit precedent, and apply it to the facts okay. of well, that let's case. Let's talk about Knights of Columbus versus Rehoboth Beach. Uh, the city allowed secular displays for Christmas on public property, but prohibited religious displays specifically because they were religious. So does this constitute unconstitutional viewpoint discrimination? Thank you, Senator. You're referring to a case I decided about a year ago as a trial court uh, judge, and I would first say I'm not sure that it's likely that a religion issue would come before the federal circuit, but it has come before me as a district court judge, and in that case, uh, which moved very quickly, uh, the city of Rehoboth modified uh, the, re the provision at issue, and so uh, I found that the uh, dispute was both moot and unripe, and therefore I did not need to reach the First Amendment issues. Uh, okay. Um, well, you had two matters that dealt with mootness, correct? One involved the city of Rehoboth Beach and the Establishment Clause, and another involved Wilmington Housing Authority and the Second Amendment. In both of these cases, you ruled that these matters were moot after the state authority in each case revised the policies that the plaintiffs took issues with. So explain to me why the doctrines of capable of repetition but evading review and voluntary cessation should not have applied in these cases. Well, thank you, Senator Blackburn. Uh, the Wilmington housing case was a second amendment case. Um, uh, and in that case, I found, I believe, mootness only with respect to the provision that had been modified after the Supreme Court issued its decision in Heller. Uh, my case was filed before the Heller decision came out, and uh, Wilmington Housing, I believe, changed uh, their regulations in light of Heller. And so I did not find mootness with respect to the challenge to the revised post-Heller uh, decision. Okay, so do you agree with the Supreme Court that the Second Amendment is a civil right? Thank you, uh, Senator. The Supreme Court has said that the right to bear and keep arms in the Second Amendment is a fundamental right. They said that in Heller and McDonald, and I follow binding Supreme Court precedent on that. So and other than the right to keep and bear arms, can you think of any other constitutional right whose exercise depends on the discretionary issuance of a license by a local official. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator. If an issue like that came before me, I would have to consider what the binding Supreme Court and circuit precedent so were. Why is this right, the Second Amendment right, singled out for this kind of restriction? 
Thank you, uh, Senator. Um, as a sitting federal judge, uh, I'm not uh, permitted to comment on uh, the merits of issues that are pending in federal court right now. And it sounds to me like the issue that you're asking about may be part of what was argued to the Supreme Court uh, in this term. Whatever the Supreme Court says in that or any other case, I will faithfully and diligently apply to whatever cases come before me, whether I remain a district court judge or whether I'm fortunate to be confirmed to the Court of Appeals. Okay, let's, uh, I'm going to run out of time, so I will ask you to give me this in writing um, because I want to know what your approach is to statutory interpretation. And I would like to know if in looking at that, if you always start with the text and then uh, I do want to know if you believe that the meaning of the Constitution changes over time. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I will yield back. Thank you, Senator Blackburn. Uh, and Judge Stark, thank you for being here today. As Senator Blackburn indicated, you and the other nominees may receive written questions, which we hope you will promptly respond to. We thank you very much for joining us. We're going to call the second panel at this point. The nominees would remain standing in place for a moment while we'll administer the oath. I think we have, do we have all five? Judge Corley? If you'll all please raise your right hand. Do you affirm the testimony you're about to give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? Let the record indicate that all five had, have answered in the affirmative. And now we'll start with uh, Ms. Calvert. You have five minutes to make a presentation, followed by opportunities for questions. Thank you, Chairman Durbin and Ranking Member Grassley for holding this hearing. And thank you to all the senators of this committee for considering my nomination. I would like to um, thank the Federal Nominations Advisory Committee in my district for recommending me to Senators Ossoff and Warnock. And Senators Ossoff and Warnock, thank you for your support and for sending my name to the White House. And thank you for your kind opening remarks this morning. Finally, I would like to thank President Biden for his nomination and the confidence he has placed in me. This is truly a dream come true. I have a few family members with me here today. First, my mother, Jacqueline Taylor. My mother only attended a year of college, but when I was growing up, she made it quite clear that she expected me to at least be a college graduate. It is because of her love and belief in me that I am here today. My sister, Alex Good, is the most generous person I know and has always showered me with admiration and support. Everyone should be so lucky to have a little sister like her. My husband, Max Shard, we met when I was a junior in college, and he initially tried to talk me out of going to law school, which didn't work. But since then, he has always supported me in my career goals while also, enjoy, while also reminding me to enjoy life. Finally, my six-year-old son, Hollis. Hollis is kind and smart and already proving himself to be quite the litigator in our household. I am blessed to have his unconditional love. To all of my family members, friends, current and former colleagues along the East Coast who are with me here in spirit, I am grateful for your support. Thank you again for your consideration, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Calvert. Judge Corley, you may proceed. 
Thank you, Chairman Durbin and Ranking Member Grassley, for including me in this hearing today and for the entire to the entire committee for considering my nomination. A special thank you to my home state senators, Senator Feinstein and Senator Padilla, and for their warm words. I'm grateful to have with me here today my best friend and husband for over 30 years, Dr. Douglas Corley. We are also joined by our two children, my daughter, First Lieutenant Morgan Jane Corley, who was able to take leave from Fort Carson, Colorado, and join me here today, and my son, Nathaniel Scott Corley, who joined us from Seattle, Washington. While it is a great honor to have been nominated by President Biden, the greatest honor of my life is to be able to call myself Doug's wife and Morgan and Nathaniel's mom. I'm also blessed to have many family members and friends watching uh, from home. The outpouring of their love and support has been overwhelming. I would also like to acknowledge Judge Charles Breyer, for whom I had the privilege of clerking for over 11 years. I learned many things from Judge Breyer, and most of them having nothing to do with the law. I would also have been supported my 10 years on the bench by a wonderful te team of clerks, and in particular, Carolyn Jacobs and Ada Means. My parents both died last year, and thus I am unable to share this moment with them. But it's worth noting that my father spent his entire professional career as a lawyer for a federal government agency. It is thus no accident that I've spent most of my career with the federal judiciary. And what, one of the things that excites me the most about my nomination is if that I am fortunate enough to be con confirmed, I can continue his legacy of service to the American public. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Judge Corley. Ms. Garrity. Good morning. Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Grassley, I want to thank you and the rest of the committee for having me here today. I'd also like to thank President Biden, for nominating me and Senators Warnock and Ossoff for recommending me to the president. I deeply appreciate my home state senator's kind words of introduction today. I am joined today by members of my family. My husband, Sam Greitzer, is an emergency department physician and a commander in the United States Public Health Service. He is a true and wonderful partner in life, and my admiration for him is immeasurable. Also here with me are our daughters, Margaret, who is nine, and Rebecca, who is eight. They are bright, spirited, kind children, and I could not be more proud of them. My beloved mother-in-law, Leslie Greitzer, is here today from South Georgia, and I am grateful for her love and support. I would like to express particular gratitude to my parents, Tom and Diane Garrity, who are here today from Illinois. They instilled in my three sisters and me the value of hard work, family, respect for the rule of law, and service to others. Both law professors, they inspired in me too a love of reading, writing, and intellectual engagement. For 47 years, they have been my North Star in how to live a life of integrity and purpose. I send love and appreciation to my sisters, Annie Helms, Catherine Moran, Miriam Petrillo, who are watching from home. To my past and present colleagues, I give my gratitude and appreciation for the years of friendship and collegiality, and in particular to Atia Holly, Sarah Tatanchi, uh, Patricia Hale, and Tara Kaganzi. For 20 years, I have sought to uphold the Constitution and the rule of law on behalf of my clients. It would be the honor of my life to serve my country as a federal judge, and as the judge's oath of office says, to administer justice without respect to persons, and to do equal, equal right by all. Thank you for, to the committee, and I welcome your questions. Thank you, Ms. Garrity. Uh, Mr. Ho. Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Grassley, and members of the committee, uh, thank you for considering my nomination today. Um, I would like to thank um, Majority Leader Schumer for his support and for the extremely kind introduction this morning, and of course, President Biden, for nominating me for this incredible opportunity to serve our country. It is truly the honor of a lifetime. Um, I'd like to acknowledge a few members of my family, starting with several who are not here today. Um, first, my, gra my late grandmother, Florida, uh, Flora Kabakungan. Um, she was a single mom. She raised and adopted her niece, my mother, and later cared for me when I was a child. Uh, she was the kindest, hardest working person that I have ever known. Um, my parents, uh, Delia and Dom Ho, 
uh, like her, immigrated from the Philippines, leaving behind everyone and everything they knew uh, in search of freedom and a better life in this amazing country. Uh, and my brother Dan, uh, an outstanding lawyer himself um, and my role model growing up in just about every way. Uh, I'm joined here today uh, by my family, um, my wife Caroline, uh, the love of my life, my best friend and the best partner that I could possibly imagine, uh, and my children, uh, Madeline, age 12, uh, and James, age 9. Um, they're missing school to be here today. Um, I am humbled and honored to be here this morning, uh, but I'm even more humbled and honored um, to call myself Caroline's husband and Madeline and James's dad. Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions today. Thank you very much, Mr. Ho. Ms. Fidal. Thank you. Chairman Durbin. You want to push the red button. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Chairman Durbin, Ranking Member Grassley, distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to appear here today. I am honored to be nominated by President Biden, and I am grateful to Secretary Raimondo for her support and for her commitment to innovation and intellectual property protection. As new technologies and globalization present evolving and challenging intellectual property issues, and as we face a moral imperative to address humanitarian and environmental crises, I am grateful to all who are engaged on these critical issues. If confirmed, I would welcome the opportunity and would be honored to lead the USPTO at this important moment in time. Joining me today are my sons, Liam and Trey, my mom, Fran, Matt, my sister, Christy and Scott, Brady, Braxton and Delaney. With us remotely are my brother, Bob, Orion, Aurora, Alexandra, Spencer, Connor, Brett, and many friends and colleagues. As a daughter and granddaughter of US Navy veterans, I know the importance of serving our great country. I know it takes dedication and sacrifice, not only from those who serve, but from family and friends. I am grateful to all of them. I only wish my father, who instilled in me a strong work ethic and dedication to country, could be with us here today. I come here today as someone who has helped develop one of our country's first artificial intelligence systems for aircraft, as somebody who has invested in and advised startups, as somebody who has drafted, prosecuted, challenged, and defended patents at the USPTO and in federal courts, as someone who has protected trademarks, copyrights, and trade secrets, as someone who served in leadership roles at GE and two of our country's top global law firms. I come here prepared for the challenges we face. I have seen our intellectual property system at its best, incentivizing research and development that leads to new technologies and improvements to existing technology that enhance our lives and bring us closer together. I've also seen that we can do better, that we can work together to build an intellectual property system that is more predictable, reliable and transparent, and in which the American people and our inventors, creators and investors will have even more confidence. Should I be confirmed, I will lead the USPTO with three guiding principles. First, to act in the best interests of our country. I have no agenda other than to serve our country, people, and industry, to advance US innovation from all and in all fields. Second, I will work with a knowledgeable and talented team at the USPTO to further strengthen our patent and trademark system by improving patent quality and the integrity of the trademark registry. Third, I will work to maintain the US as an innovation world leader by engaging on key issues with all stakeholders, members of Congress, commerce, other federal, federal agencies, the public, and our international allies. I fully appreciate the honor and privilege of serving my country in this important role. Should I be confirmed, I will roll up my sleeves and get to work to advance intellectual property rights that incentivize innovation and drive economic growth. Thank you, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thanks, Ms. Fidel. Um, we're gonna start questions to the panel, and I apologize in advance with five important nominees. We won't be able to give each the attention they deserve, but I hope we can do a good job at this end of the table. Ms. Garrity, when I read your biography, I realized that you clerked for Judge James Zagel in Chicago, and it brought back a flood of memories because I was the staff assistant to the Senate, State Senate Judiciary Committee in Springfield, <laughs> and Jim Zagel used to appear before that committee regularly as a prosecutor. So we go back a long, long way. I'm sure that was an interesting experience in your own legal career. And I've noted that you've received letters of recommendation from a number of people uh, suggesting you're the right person for the federal court. 
and most notably, many who were on the opposite side of litigation that you were engaged in. Uh, and I think that speaks well of you, that they respected you even though you were adversaries in a courtroom. You made a specialty of representing individuals who were incarcerated for their inability to pay a fine or a fee, something you've referred to, uh, some others have referred to as modern day debtor's prison. In the year 2020, a prominent legal publication in Georgia, the Fulton County Daily Journal, named you the attorney of the year in large part for this work. In your experience, what are some of the negative consequences, both to the individuals and to America, from the practice of incarcerating people because they're poor? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I, first, I would, I would say uh, that the Supreme Court has said that there can be no equal justice under law when the kind of trial a person gets depends on the amount of money that they have. Um, throughout my career as an advocate, uh, I have uh, tried to enforce uh, the Constitution and the rule of law on behalf of indigent defendants, um, and as an advocate have been uh, critical of incarceration for debt under circumstances that do not comply with uh, the Supreme Court's directions in that area. Thank you for that. I'm going to go to Mr. Ho and uh, make reference to uh, a gentleman who came here to say nice things about you, Chuck Schumer. He said you've had extraordinary success as an advocate and the record speaks for itself. You spent most of your career fighting for the civil rights and liberties of other Americans, all Americans. In particular, you defended the right to vote and recently the right to be counted accurately in the census. And you've litigated at the trial and appellate level, including appearances before the United States Supreme Court. I also understand that you've used social media during the time uh, that you've served as advocate and exercising your First Amendment rights, you've commented on a number of topics. Now you've been nominated to set aside your advocacy, your life's work, and to tell us that you can be a federal judge and that we can trust you to know the difference between serving as an advocate and a judge. Why should we? Uh, thank you for that question, Chairman Durbin, and for giving me the opportunity to address this issue. Um, I, I very much understand that my current role as an advocate is different, very different from the role that I've been nominated for, and that like every judge, um, I have to set aside my past advocacy work, um, the work that I've done consistent with my ethical responsibilities of zealous advocacy on behalf of my clients, to serving as a fair, neutral, impartial arbiter of the law. Now, with respect to social media, I want to say to members of this committee that I very much regret the tone that I have taken on social media from time to time, particularly if it's given anyone the impression that I wouldn't be impartial. Um, I, as in my role as an advocate, um, have um, taken a role on social media. It's been a part of my job. Um, I've pushed the envelope to break through, but I regret the times that I've crossed the line with overheated rhetoric. Um, it doesn't reflect who I am. It doesn't reflect how I've shown up in court or how I've conducted myself in professional settings. I'm deeply committed to the principle of equal justice under the law, and if confirmed, I'll do everything I can to ensure that everyone who comes before the court gets a fair shake, a fair opportunity to be heard, um, and ultimately equal treatment under the law. It's been noted already that uh, your family background plays an important role in your values. Would you like to speak to that for a moment? Um, Sure, and uh, again, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about that, uh, Chairman Durbin. Um, my uh, mother's father, I never had the opportunity to meet him. He um, ser served in World War II in the United States Armed Forces of the Far East in the Philippines. Um, he, he died at a young age. Um, my mother was um, 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 sent to the United States to live with her aunt who adopted her, a woman I, known, I knew as my grandmother, and she instilled in me the values of hard work, um, love for family um, that I've tried to carry uh, throughout my life and throughout my career. Thank you. Judge, uh, Senator Grassley, you're next. You know, congratulations to all of you, and you'll, most of you will get written questions for me. <clears throat> I'm going to start with Mr. Ho. I think I'm going to carry on in a very general question that you just responded to from uh, the chairman, but I want to direct it to some specific things you've said. Uh, quote, it seems reasonable to give deference to the views of the average inner city resident over those of the Second Amendment civil libertarians, end of quote. 
You have also suggested that the First Amendment should be interpreted as protecting minority groups, but not others. Could you ex please explain the legal basis for the idea that the Bill of Rights protections char uh, change based upon what community a person is in? Uh, thank you for those uh, questions, uh, Ranking Member Grassley. Um, I believe you're referring to a pair of law review articles that I wrote about a decade ago. Um, one was about the Heller decision, and I want to make clear that the Supreme Court has held that there's an individual right to keep and bear arms under the Second Amendment, which lower court judges, including myself, if I were fortunate to be confirmed, would be bound to apply, and I'd have no hesitation um, in applying it. Um, the second article, I believe, referred to the issue of anonymity um, and the First Amendment, and the Supreme Court held in NAACP versus Alabama that there are um, protections uh, that relate to anonymity in terms of group membership, particularly when one is uh, a member of a group that is um, treated with hostility or a disfavored minority, and I believe I was referring to the Supreme Court's precedent in that area. Okay. Uh, in another interview you gave, 2013, you described yourself as, quote, unquote, a wild-eyed sort of liberal, or no, wild-eyed sort of leftist, end of quote, uh, who is, quote, accused sometimes of seeing racial discrimination everywhere I look, end of quote. In 2017, you wrote that a colleague of yours asked you, quote, Dale, do you do what you do because you want to help people or because you hate conservatives, end of quote. You replied, quote, for me, righteous indignation can provide a sense of moral clarity and motivate the long hours needed to get the work done, end of quote. So question, given your commitment to progressive politics and your apparent anger at conservatives, how can parties who come before you be confident that you'll be a fair and impartial judge? Uh, thank you for that question, Ranking Member Grassley. The 2017 remark, I believe you're referring to something that I stated in church where I was referring to a joke that a friend of mine um, had told, and I think I was trying to make the opposite point. Um, the first principle of my religious faith is a respect for the worth and dignity of all people, and the point that I was trying to make is that when someone gets angry, sometimes you can feel a kind of rush of power from that, but it's not sustaining. It's not something that can motivate you in the long run, that if you want to do good works in this world, it has to come from a different place, a place of love for your fellow human. Okay. My last question to you would be this. Uh, since 2014, as a professor uh, of uh, New York University's Racial Justice Clinic, according to your syllabus, you teach critical race theory, telling students they will become, quote, familiar with theories of race and the law, including critical race theory, and will explore how these theories can help in developing legal strategies. So in your view, how should critical race theory factor into interpreting the law? Uh, thank you for that question, Ranking Member Grassley. Um, the role of a judge is not to make or apply academic theories. The role of a judge is to apply precedent um, to the specific facts of the cases that come before the court. And I'm not aware of any precedent that makes academic theories of that sort a relevant consideration for a court. Okay. Ms. Vidal, uh, you have experience, uh, very much experience litigating patent cases. Based on your experience, what are the biggest issues currently with the patent system? But I'd like to be a little, a little specific in this sense. Uh, uh, and don't, I don't expect a lot of examples, but give me at least one example of policies enacted in previous patent office directors would you keep in place and which would you change? Maybe one of each. Uh, th thank you, Senator Grassley. Um, in terms of what happened in the prior administration, I know that there were policies set forth, including on 101, on patent eligibility. I think that is an area that is always deserving of attention because the, the law is not set. It's, it's very, as, as every single federal circuit judge has said, that it's very difficult to understand the contours of the law. So that is something that I would certainly 
always revisit to make sure that the any guidelines are consistent with the law, they are right now, um, and that they're promoting innovation. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Grassley. Senator Leahy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first off, I would note I'm very impressed by the four nominees for uh, judicial nominations. Uh, as one is, before I was in the Senate, tried an awful lot of cases before a lot of different judges, some nominated by Republican presidents, some by Democratic presidents. I've always been impressed when they're good judges, and I'd allow that to determine what happened in the case. Uh, if I was back practicing law, I'd be happy to appear before any one of the four of you. I'm not saying that to try to gain um, uh, 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 favor, because I don't expect I'm going to be, be before any of your, your courts. And uh, Ms. Fidel, I appreciate the time you took in chatting with me uh, yesterday. You know, I, as I said, the, uh, there, the Food and Drug Administration has been raising the alarm about the ways in which the patent system is being abused by brand drug manufacturers to shut out competitors. Certainly, we've been concerned about this in my state of Vermont. Uh, when we can drive a few miles across the Canadian border and see what happens when competition is allowed. Um, and prices come down. President Trump's FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb, Dr. Gottlieb, referred to patent thickets built up around biologics as purely designed to deter the entry of approved biosimilars. Uh, In September of this year, President Biden's FDA wrote to the PTO, raising several areas of concern. The end result is the practices that were identified by both the Biden and Trump FDA as uh, causing higher prices for American consumers. Again, as I said, if you're in Vermont, drive a few miles across the Canadian border and you see the difference. So do you agree with the recent bipartisan consensus at the FDA that certain abuses of the patent system contribute to the high cost of prescription drugs by preventing competitors from entering the market. Thank you, Senator Leahy, for raising that very important issue. Um, I'm aware of all of the concerns about patent abuses and potential patent abuses. Um, I do think that one thing the Patent Office can do uh, is to make sure that the Patent Office is always issuing the highest quality patents. I think to your point about patent thickets, the, the conversation that I've heard is that there are follow-on patents that add marginal value that have um, you know, additions to the original patent, for example, changing the color of a particular drug. So uh, certainly I would work, uh, if I'm fortunate enough to be confirmed, on strengthening the value of IP. Well, and that's something that uh, uh, both the Trump administration and Biden administration have said, and we should use all the tools available to crack down on the type of abuses they've said. Now, in recent um, years, the Patent Trial and Appeal Board, or PTAP, has declined to institute uh, post-issuance proceedings when district court has a trial scheduled to take place. Well, uh, then the district court trial inevitably ends up being delayed. And so one recent survey found that patent trials are delayed 94% of the time. And it's also clear that part of the problem is PTO's willingness to defer to a district court's initial often incorrect trial date. Is there any other situation you can think of where if a government agency is basing decisions on data that is wrong 94% of the time, is you simply continue applying that uh, procedure without reevaluating it? Uh, thank you, Senator. And I have a lot of experience with the procedure that you've mentioned on, actually on, on both sides of the V. I've certainly gone to the PTAB to attempt to invalidate patents I think should never have issued. And I've been a recipient of those same requests where I'm defending patents. 
Um, the, the, the policy that you're referring to is actually a presidential decision, as I know you know, the FinTiv decision, which allows the PTO, the PTAB discretion on whether to institute. Um, I, I do know that with regard to that, there, there is a way to get around FinTiv by stipulating that you're not going to rely on the same art in district courts. So I just want to make note of that. Um, in, in terms of your question, um, it's one where you know, I, I would certainly, if confirmed, want to look into that more closely, would want to work with you and stakeholders and uh, try and determine if there's more that can be done there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a, another question I'll follow up in writing. Thanks, Thank you, Senator Lee. Thank you, Senator. Senator Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning and welcome to, to you all. Congratulations. Um, Ms. Garrity, did you call... Uh, Governor Brian Kemp, a pioneer of voter suppression. Uh, Senator, Senator Kennedy, I do not believe I have said that. Okay. You may want to check your records. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, Mr. Ho. Um. Did, did, did you say, I support compelled disclosure of political donations by wealthy individuals, but not by minorities? Uh, for Senator Kennedy, thank you for the gift of the notepads for my children. You I really appreciate it. I don't recall using those words before, Senator. I, I do remember. Okay. Oh, okay. I've got a bunch here. Um, You've described yourself as a, quote, wild-eyed sort of leftist. Do I have that right? Senator, I think I was referring to a caricature of the way that I think other people may have described me, not how I would describe myself. And I want to assure you that I understand that the role of a judge is to set aside whatever personal views right. that person may I, have. I heard your testimony. Um, Have you called Republicanism, well, strike that. Did you say, quote, Republicanism is an anti-democratic virus? No, Senator. I don't believe I've used those words. Okay. You're under oath now. Y yes, Senator. I, I, I don't believe I've used those words. Okay. I, I do remember saying last year that there was a loss of confidence in our elections that has spread kind of like a virus. Right. Well, that's, um, a, that's a long way from uh, calling the Republican Party an anti-democratic virus. Yes, it's, it's very different, and I don't believe I used those words, right. Senator. Right. Uh, if you did use those words, w will you p pull down your, your nomination? Uh, S Senator, I, I don't believe I've used those words. But if you did, w will you withdraw? It, it, it's hard for me to imagine a scenario in which but I, I would I'm just saying, assume it. If you said it, will you withdraw? If I were quoting someone else saying it to describe that kind of sentence, I I, I wouldn't be expressing my own views. But, I, Senator, I, I don't believe I've ever used those words. I've okay. represented. Did, did you, um, did, did, when you made, you, you sent out those personal tweets about Senator Cotton, Senator Blackburn, and Senator Cornyn, did you mean them at the time? Um, without hearing those tweets, um, Senator Kennedy, it's hard for me to remember precisely, you know, what was said or what I was thinking at the time. I do very much regret the tone that I've taken on social media from time to time. I know that I've crossed the line from time to time, and I... When, when, when you crossed the line, did you mean it? Uh, without knowing the specific context or the specific tweet that you're referring to, Senator Kennedy, it's... It's kind of hard for me to say, but... But do you generally tweet things you don't mean? Um, Senator Kennedy, I would agree with you that Twitter has become a very coarse place. I, I, I don't want to debate Twitter. Um, do, do you generally tweet things that you don't mean? Well, Senator Kennedy, I've contributed to the coarseness on Twitter sometimes by pushing the envelope to right, break but through. when you did it, did you mean it? it it's hard for me to respond to that kind of generally, Senator Kennedy, uh, without a specific You're a smart example. guy. I'm sure you can. You either meant it or you didn't. You got two choices, door A, door B. 
Well, Senator Kennedy, I, I know that I've pushed the envelope. Okay. And you regret it? I, I do regret it, Senator Do you Kennedy. regret it because you didn't mean it? Or do you regret it because it might cause you not to be confirmed? Senator Kennedy, I, I regret it because I think it's contributed to the coarseness of our discourse overall, and I, I think it would when, be when better. When did you have this, uh, this uh, epiphany that everybody has equal dignity and worth? When you were nominated or? Well, I believe you're. Including you're, Republicans. Well, well I, I believe you're referring to my religious faith. Um, no, I'm not. Senator. I'm referring to your coarseness. coarseness. Well, the equal dignity and worth is a principle of my religious faith, Senator. It's also a principle of, of, of morals and good judgment. I, I'm, I'm over. Mr. Ho, you're a smart man, I can tell. But I think you're an angry man. And I, th I really have great concerns about voting for you. We, we, don't, we don't need federal judges who are angry. We need federal judges who are fair and can see both points of view. And you said these things. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Kennedy. Senator Feinstein. Thanks very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the four district court nominees on today's panel come from a diverse background of experiences. You've worked in private practice, as public interest advocates, as public defenders, and as federal magistrate judges. This diversity of experience is important, and um, I'd like to go down the line, beginning with Ms. Calvert. Can you share briefly which of your experiences you believe will be most important to shaping your service as a federal district court judge if you're confirmed? and why that experience has been so critical to your development as an attorney. And I'd like to ask each one of you to do that, please. Thank you, Senator Feinstein. I believe that my experience- Would you speak directly oh, into the I mic? I apologize. Yeah. I believe that my experience as a federal public defender over the past nine and a half years has prepared me um, to be a good judge if I am so fortunate to be concerned, confirmed. Um, over the years, I have learned the value of explaining the law to clients who are not familiar with the federal justice system, um, the value of understanding their position and trying to um, present their positions to the judges that I regularly appear in front of. I have also learned the value of having collegial relationships with the my adversaries, the prosecutors who I um, regularly appear against in court. And I believe that all of that will make me, um, will help me to be a judge who is fair to all parties, um, listens to the facts, and applies the law faithfully and fairly. Thank you. Next. Uh, thank you, Senator Feinstein, and thank you again Could for you your. Speak directly. Oh, sorry. Thank you again for your warm words. My 10 years as a magistrate judge, in which I have presided over hundreds of cases with the parties. Uh, consent and issued nearly 2,000 written opinions and presided over, uh, I think, almost 16 jury trials has well prepared me to serve as a district court judge. Thank you. Next. Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, I have had 20 years of litigation experience, first as a criminal appellate defense lawyer, and for the last 18 years litigating complex civil actions, uh, mostly in federal court. Um, and uh, I have a broad grasp of constitutional analysis and of the federal rules of civil procedure uh, from that experience. I've litigated in a large range of subject matters relating, uh, uh, including equal protection, uh, due process, the takings clause, religious liberties, and so on. And um, I have, uh, from year one to year 20, been involved in the nuts and bolts of litigation on a daily basis, having taken or defended hundreds of depositions, uh, prepared evidentiary hearings, uh, been lead counsel in many class action cases, and at this point in my career, I believe I have the, the experience, the energy, uh, the intellectual capacity, and the temperament to make a good judge and serve my country in this way. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Feinstein. Um, I've been a practicing attorney for more Could than- Could you pull up the mic, please? Oh, sure, of course. 
Um, I've been a practicing attorney for more than 15 years. I started as a law clerk first in the Southern District of New York, the court to which I've been nominated, um, and later to an appellate court. I spent a few years in private practice at a major New York law firm, Freed Frank. Um, I worked at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund as a civil rights lawyer there. Uh, for the last eight and a half years or so, I've been director of the Voting Rights Project at the ACLU. Um, I've been lead or co-lead counsel at about half a dozen trials. I've argued half a dozen or so appeals, including two before the United States Supreme Court. Um, I just want to say again, I understand that that work that I've done for the majority of my career as an advocate on behalf of my particular clients is very different from the role to which I've been nominated. But if there's one through line, it's this. Um, I have sought as a voting rights lawyer for the last 10 years or so to try to ensure that every American who's eligible to vote has an opportunity to do so. Across the ideological spectrum, I've represented people who have been registered to, uh, as members of both political parties um, because I believe that's how our system works. Everyone gets a say, and then we count the votes, and then the chips fall. Thank you. Please. Thank you, Senator. I would say that it would be my law firm leadership experience uh, that taught me to look impartially at issues across client bases, um, to lead an organization in a way that is fair to all, that gives people opportunity. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Feinstein. Senator Lee. Thank you very much. Mr. Ho, I'd like to start with you. Does the Constitution sometimes compel results in particular cases that are unpopular or contrary to the will of a majority of Americans? Um, yes, Senator Lee. I think the purpose of the Constitution is to put, well, one of the purposes of the Constitution anyway is that it serves a counter-majoritarian function um, and puts a few issues of individual civil rights and liberties um, beyond... Um, uh, beyond uh, debate, uh, yeah. I think that's fair. Yeah. Uh, it recognizes the, the risk of mob rule, in other, in other words, if, if all you're doing is simply giving in to the will of a simple majority of Americans at any given time, um, the human condition can't flourish. I was making essentially this point on a series of tweets I sent out on October 8th of 2020, a series of tweets explaining the difference between a constitutional republic like ours, where our system of government is constrained by a series of laws, a laws governing the making of laws in our government and the fact that uh, these things can be counter-majoritarian, and that's good. And in, in other words, as I explained it, democracy itself isn't the objective. That is, with the understanding that if you refer to pure democracy as simple majoritarian rule, that's not the objective. The objective is to have a, a situation in which uh, the human condition can flourish. That's sometimes squelched when individual liberties are crushed, when majoritarian impulses are allowed to erode the fundamental rights of others. I was a little surprised to, to see that uh, in, in response to one of those tweets, you retweeted, you, you tweeted this as a retweet, quote, the mask is off. Wasn't sure what that meant. You made clear in a subsequent retweet and with the following commentary. Translation, these are your words, not mine. If we can't maintain minoritarian rule, despite the Electoral College, Senate malapportionment, extreme partisan gerrymandering, and strict conditions on voting, then we'll rely on a 6-3 SCOTUS to block, and, uh, 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 to block any elected Democratic agenda. Uh, did you, in fact, send that? Um, I, I believe I did tweet that, it, Senator, and, and I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity it, to address what, this. What, what did you mean by this? And, and, and I, I, we've got limited time, so I'm going to ask you some specific questions. What did you mean by Senate malapportionment? What does that mean? Well. Um, Senator Lee, I, I just want to be clear. I think I misinterpreted um, your tweet, and I regret that I did that, and I want to apologize to you. I appreciate that, that, and I appreciate the apology. I want to know what you meant by Senate malapportionment. I'm not familiar with that term. What does it mean? Um, I, Senator Lee, I was responding to an ongoing debate, um, or I'm sorry, news reports at the time, that there were state legislators who even before the election, were contemplating fabricating some sort of pretext by which they could ignore their state's own votes for president and directly select their presidential electors. And it was hard for me to imagine anything How is that characterized as Senate malapportionment? That's not, uh, I mean, that might refer to your, uh, 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 you, maybe you made a, a separate dig somewhere at the Electoral College. You, you did. 
uh, you said, maintain minoritarian rule despite the electoral college. So that might describe that part of your tweet. That doesn't describe Senate malapportionment. It, it appears to me that what you mean by that is uh, you, you're challenging the principle of equal representation among the states, notwithstanding their different populations. Well, said early, I, I just want to make clear, obviously, we have a federal system. And um, the apportionment of two senators per state is um, instantiated in Article Two of the Constitution. If I were confirmed, is that malapportionment? Uh, n n no, Senator Lee, I wouldn't describe it that way. But you did. Uh, but Senator Lee, I guess what I was trying to respond to was this notion that was being bandied about that state legislators who that, that that doesn't that doesn't explain Senate malapportionment. There's no planet on which that could be interpreted that way. Are you aware that the Constitution itself? makes one thing preemptively unconstitutional. There is one feature of the Constitution that cannot, under the terms of the Constitution, be amended. Are you aware of what that is? Uh, Senator Lee, um, I don't believe in my 15 years of um, practice in courts around the country that that particular issue has come up in any of my oh, yeah, because cases. it's not litigated, because it's in the Constitution, but it's there in the text. It's what you derisively referred to as Senate malapportionment. It's the principle of equal representation in the Senate. It's the one feature of the Constitution that cannot, may not, must never, ever be amended. The fact that you referred to it derisively, along with, by the way, denigrating the Electoral College itself, and the Supreme Court of the United States, the, the superior court, the court of last resort, to which you'd be answerable if confirmed to this position, is deeply troubling to me. I, I don't know how we're supposed to confirm you to this. Now, this, is, this has nothing to do with, with how you feel about any elected official, me or otherwise. It has everything to do with your open contempt for the Constitution, which I, I know of no other way of reading this, it, in, including that one feature of the Constitution that can't be amended. How do you serve as a federal judge when you've denigrated the Supreme Court uh, uh, apparently under the, the, the theory that they're operating as some sort of partisan hacks and, and other essential features of the Constitution. How, how do you defend that? How do you, how do you stand here and say that you can be supported in being appointed to an office whose job it is to interpret that document and to adhere those precedents made by the Supreme Court that you've derided? Senator Lee, um, in that tweet, um, I was trying to caricature a view that I thought that others had about the right that they would have to directly select their own state's presidential electors and to ignore the will of voters entirely. That's I certainly not did what not mean. Senate malapportionment means. We both know that, and you're under oath. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Lee. Senator Feinstein? I'm sorry, Senator Whitehouse. Thanks, Chairman. Let me um, welcome the panel here, and um, let me just, for the record, uh, refer my colleagues to um, Republican nominees Michael Truncale, Daniel Trainer, Corey Wilson, and John Bush, um, whose litany of intemperate remarks caused no concern whatsoever on the Republican side during their nomination proceedings. Um, so I think the selective outrage obviously has its role in the Senate. Um, but I do want to point out that there's something selective about today's outrage, given some of the outrages that Trump nominees brought into this hearing room. Uh, my concern actually is something different. It's about juries. Um, I believe we have seen a fairly persistent effort by the Supreme Court to undermine civil juries uh, over and over. It's been made harder for plaintiffs to get their cases before civil juries, civil jury verdicts, and damages awards have been undone and undermined. And of course, there's a persistent pattern of sidelining, letting big corporations sideline people entirely away from juries through mandatory arbitration buried deep 
in long and not fairly negotiated contracts. And the result is that in many federal courthouses around the country, jury trials are extremely scarce. And um, I think that's unfortunate because I think that, well, I agree with uh, Blackstone in his commentaries who said that one of the purposes of the jury is that it prevents the encroachments of the wealthy and powerful upon everybody else because of requiring folks coming before the jury to stand equal before the law. A mighty corporation comes to Senate or congressional venues and they're not very equal with ordinary people. They have armies of lobbyists, they have enormous amounts of money that they spend through PACs and super PACs. Uh, and it can be frustrating and annoying to be a big corporation dragged before a jury and having to suffer the indignity of being treated on equal par with individuals. Um, and I think that the founders built the jury into the Constitution, into the Seventh Amendment, with that view in mind. And it was Cassus Belli for the revolution when the Crown tried to interfere with that American right. So I worry about the um, evaporation of jury trials and would like to know what each of you will do in your courtrooms to keep that right alive and vibrant in your courthouses. Start with you, Ms. Calvert, and we'll just go quickly across to the four who are going to be trial judges. Thank you, Senator Whitehouse, for that question. Um, in my background as a criminal defense attorney, the jury trial is a bedrock principle, and I can assure you that um, for any litigant who comes before me, I will do everything in my power to make sure that they have a fair jury trial. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. In my 10 years as a magistrate judge, what I do is when a case comes before me, very early in the case, I give them a trial date, and that date sticks. And if it, the case gets to the point where uh, they're ready for trial, then I've been fortunate we've been able to select jurors, and I do my best to give everybody a fair trial. Thank you, Senator. I fully concur um, with your remarks about the importance of the jury trial. Uh, if I am confirmed as a judge, I would fully respect uh, the Sixth and Seventh Amendment uh, right to a jury trial. I believe uh, uh, juries are... Um, uh, important because they bring the voice of the people to the act of governing. Um, and About the only way that they really do directly, right? Yes, sir. And they, they take a, a cross-section of the community and have them speak on important uh, questions. They also uh, serve an important educational role um, and uh, give uh, people a sense of um, ownership um, and membership in their own government. Mr. Ho. Uh, thank you, Senator Whitehouse. I agree with everything that um, my fellow nominees have said. Um, the right to a trial, um, uh, a jury of one's peers, as protected by the Sixth and Seventh Amendments, is one of the bedrock uh, protections in the Bill of Rights. And I would do everything I can to make sure that those rights are respected if I were confirmed. It's incredibly hard to put the fix in with a jury. And when you try, it's actually a crime. And that's something that's worth keeping in mind as we deal with an increasingly special interest driven um, Congress. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Whitehouse. Senator Tillis. And uh, thanks and congratulations to all of you for your nominations and to your family. So the four of you may be pleased to know I won't be asking you any questions because Ms. Vidal and I have to spend a little bit of time together. But again, thank you for your um, time here today. Ms. Vidal, uh, first off, i got to congratulate you. I think you've got one of the biggest groups of supporters uh, in any of the hearings over the past year. Looks like you've got a lot of people here in a big family. Um, I did like your answer to Senator Grassley's question about current jur jurisprudence. I think you used the word contours. I think current jurisprudence is in a shambles right now, and we have to work on fixing it and providing clarity. So I thank you for that answer. Uh, do you support legislative efforts to reform patent eligibility to provide greater clarity? Give me some idea of what that would look like. 
Thank you, Senator Tillis. Um, I, I agree with you that we need more clarity when it comes to patent eligibility. We need more clarity so that inventors will be incentivized to invent and investors will be incentivized to invest. Whether that comes via legislation or whether the Supreme Court takes a case on cert, uh, I believe that that clarity is warranted. As to the shape that takes, as you, as you know, Senator, that's a very complex issue, especially when it comes to defining things like abstract ideas. So th that is an issue that I would, would appreciate working with you on if I am fortunate enough to be confirmed and hearing from stakeholders on it. You know, we've done a lot of work in my office and it's been a pleasure to work with uh, Senator Leahy as chairman of the Intellectual Property Subcommittee and uh, Senator Coons. I think there's a lot of work to be done there and I think that you could be very helpful with your expertise. Uh, do you believe there should be a technicity or field of technology requirement in order for a patent to be eligible for protection? Senator, that's a very good question. Um, I don't know that I have a per se answer on that. I think that if there's questions like that, I would very much be interested in, in working with you on that and you know, engaging stakeholders on that. I, I know there's a survey right now um, at the patent office where they're investigating whether 101 you know, incentivizes innovation. I know that you're, you're well aware of that. Um, I, I look forward to hearing the results of that before answering that. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I'm a big supporter of changes to PTAB proceedings. <clears throat> Uh, during the past administration. I believe these changes have uh, rebalanced PTAB and ensured that it no longer simply a death squad for the patent rights of small businesses and independent inventors. Uh, my support for your nomination is in part gonna be contingent on continuing these policies. Uh, so will you commit to continuing these reforms? Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, I understand all the reforms that have taken place, and I know that, especially with regard to some of the areas that you care a lot about, like Fintiv, uh, that there's been a request for comments on that. I've read your comments, Senator. I've read some of the other comments. Um, I, I believe reform is important, um, and I, it, it's something that I would continue to want to engage in, including with the stakeholders and reviewing the forms in more detail. Well, thank you. I think that uh, that's uh, we're, we've got a long list of uh, questions for the record that we're going to submit, so I would appreciate appreciate. I wouldn't expect you to give a complete response here, but I would like to have that as a part of the, uh, the record as we move forward uh, with your nomination. I strongly support the policies of underlying FinTiv factor, and I'm concerned about PTAB application of the second of these factors, the proximity, proximity of court's trial date to PTAB's uh, projected statutory deadline for a final written decision. Um, so one of the things that I'm hoping we can do, if you're confirmed, uh, would you commit to undertake a study and review of this matter and consider whether FinTIV should be modified to account for unrealistic trial scheduling? That touches on a, a question I think that Senator Leahy also asked. Uh, thank you, Senator. And I believe there's the preliminary work for that going on right now. Uh, I think given the debate over FinTIV and its application and whether it's fairly applied to, not, not whether it's fairly applied, but how it impacts different stakeholders, I think it, it definitely warrants consideration. I would look forward to engaging on that with you. Okay, thank you. We will submit, uh, as I said, I don't want to give you too much homework, but this is a very important area. And it happens to be an area where I think we're working on a bipartisan basis. And trying to protect the interest of all the stakeholders, but it's an area where we have to make progress. One of the, the great things about this country is it's founded on innovation. It's intellectual property protections were enshrined in the Constitution. And I, for one, think that we have to continue to incentivize, particularly the new creators. Uh, and I think that's best done by a lot of uh, reforms that we've been working on for several years now. Uh, just a, a final comment, Mr. Chair. The, um, you know, they, uh, I don't normally get into specifics of tweets or comments, uh, and I'm not going to here, but I do always go back and look at it in the context of temperament. So I didn't get a chance to ask uh, any of the judicial nominees any questions here, but as I go through a decision process as to whether or not I'd support your nominations, it has more to do with, and, and to Senator Whitehouse's point, uh, I think it's valid to say that there were uh, uh, conservative nominees that probably made things, uh, made statements they wish they hadn't. Uh, but I look at those as less about the, the plain text and more about a pattern of behavior that would make me question a person's temperament. And that would be the basis for my ultimate decision on the nominees. Thank you all again for being here and congratulations to you and your families. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Senator Tillis. Senator Klobuchar. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Um, I guess I'll start with you, uh, Mr. Ho, since Senator Tillis, um, appreciate your words. Um, and I think many, many nominees we've had come before us have written tweets or articles or things. And 
Um, it's happened on both sides many, many times. And you consider someone's whole career. And I'm looking at your career. Uh, you clerk for Judge Robert Smith of the New York Court of Appeals. Uh, Judge Smith, who was appointed by a Republican governor, is that right? That's correct, Senator And Republican. he wrote to this committee in support of your nomination, saying that your, getting to what Senator Tillis raised, temperament, that your personality and temperament, I just thought that was a good segue, um, make you exceptionally well-suited for judicial office, and that you always expressed your views, quote, appropriately and respectfully. Um, if confirmed, how would you ensure that you impartially review the facts and the law when approaching the case? And why don't you comment a little about your temperament? Uh, thank you, Senator Klobuchar. Um, I became a lawyer because I deeply, deeply believe in the principle of equal justice under the law, um, that everyone who walks into court, regardless of who they are, what their interests are, what their claims are, um, deserves a fair opportunity to be heard um, and ultimately equal treatment by the court and under the law. Um, that's the principle that led me to have a career as a civil rights lawyer. Um, I understand that's an advocacy role that's very, very different and that I'm setting that aside and um, we'll take on a different role, one of impartial, neutral adjudicator of the law. But the through line, I think, throughout my career has been a commitment to the equality of all people. Mm -hmm. And you also have extensive litigation experience with approximately 90% of your practice appearing before the federal courts. You've argued at every level of the federal judiciary, including twice before the Supreme Court. Uh, why do you think that experience matters? Well, I hope that the experience that I've had both at the trial and the appellate levels um, gives me an insight into the functioning of a trial court. I've been um, lead or co-lead counsel in about half a dozen trials over the last um, five or six years. Um, but then seeing how a trial record um, is considered by an appellate court um, at the circuit level and then ultimately at the Supreme Court level, I think gives me a good sense for um, how to run a district courtroom. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, judge Corley, um, as a sitting magistrate judge, our last nominee for Minnesota was also a magistrate judge, and I think I nominated, we, I worked with the White House on another magistrate judge who's done very well uh, in her role as a federal judge. Um, you are a frequent participant in the Judicial Clerkship Institute, a training course for law clerks. Uh, you're also involved in the ABA's Judicial Intern Opportunity Program, which provides internship opportunities uh, for traditionally underrepresented groups. Uh, my husband's a law professor, and he's doing a similar thing uh, with some of his uh, the students in Baltimore and trying to get them into uh, the law. What have these experiences done to shape your views of the role of a judge, uh, particularly with respect to serving as a mentor for young attorneys? When I first became a judge 10 years ago, one thing I did not appreciate is how important it is uh, just to be out and to speak and to mentor, to go to a bar events and just sit with particularly new new attorneys and, and just, just speak with them and to teach. It is really, I think, uh, actually as important as the work we do on the bench because uh, as a magistrate judge, and I'm fortunate, if I'm fortunate enough to be confirmed as a district court judge, we're real leaders in the community. We're the face of the federal judiciary, which is a bedrock of our, of our democracy. And so it's critical to being out there. Okay, very good. And I'll ask the other judicial nominees questions in writing. Congratulations. Ms. Vidal, I thought we'd end with patents because that's a lot of fun. Um, um, could you talk about your experience as a patent litigator, how that's prepared you for this job? And I guess specifically, um, how can the PTO, PTO strengthen post-grant review while preventing some uh, well-financed companies from abusing the process to impose cost and delay on small innovators? Uh, thank you, Senator. In terms of my experience and how that has prepared me for this job, as a litigator, I've litigated both sides of most of the issues that are before the PTO, um, whether it's uh, patent eligibility or at the PTAB. 
Um, I've also, as a law firm leader, had to take positions that were fair and impartial to all entities, to all the firm's clients, and two major law firms. So I, I think that prepares me you know, quite well for, for this position. Um, in terms of your second uh, question um, about the PTAB, um, I understand there are some concerns about the way the PTAB is being used. I know that there was some decision making by the T PTAB that uh, sought to curb some of that. Um, and, and I also believe that small entities need as much access to the PTAB as anyone else. And, um, and I think you'll be delighted to know that the PTAB is working on a pro bono process right now. Um, it exists for patent prosecution, but not at the PTAB. And I think with that program, um, it will offset a lot of the cost to some of these smaller mid-sized entities um, that, that, that the larger entities are not so okay. concerned with. Thank you. I do a lot of work with consolidation, as you may have heard, and some of these competitive issues. And this is a piece of it that gets uh, overlooked. So thank you very much, and thank you to all of you. Thank you, Senator Klobuchar. Klobuchar Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In his first year in office, President Biden has made a pattern of nominating extremes, partisans, and radicals to serve in the administration, but especially to serve on the bench. And unfortunately, that pattern continues today. Uh, Mr. Ho, you will not be surprised that I want to address some questions to you. And in my view, your record reflects that same pattern of finding someone who has been an extreme partisan, who has been a radical, and President Biden trying to put judicial robes on that partisan and radical agenda. And I would note at the outset that that's not just my characterization. Uh, you yourself have described yourself as, quote, a wild-eyed leftist, and further, as someone, quote, accused sometimes of seeing discrimination everywhere you look. Is, is, is that right? Uh, Senator Cruz, I think the key word in that quote is accused. Uh, what I was doing- Let's start with the first one, wild-eyed sort of leftist. Well, again, Senator Cruz, I think I was characterizing how others have caricatured myself. Okay. Well, uh, let's take a quote you wrote in, in November 2017, and I found it amusing, the exchange a moment ago with one of the Democratic senators about, oh, some older intemperate statements. I would note just sitting here, this, this may be a first in, in that you have tweeted attacks at multiple members of this committee, including Senator Lee, Senator Cotton, Senator Blackburn, Senator Cornyn, and, and far from being intemperate statements when you were a teenager, and most of these tweets occurred last year. So in the last 12 months, uh, you have engaged, or the last about 18 months, uh, you have engaged in partisan attacks on multiple members of this committee. But you also wrote in November 2017, quote, in these dark times, I've been fortunate to find tremendous sense of purpose in my work as a civil rights lawyer. But as a colleague of mine asked me over lunch recently, Dale, do you do this because you want to help people or because you hate conservatives? What he was getting at is that anger can, in fact, be a tremendous source of power. For me, righteous indignation can provide a sense of moral clarity and motivate the long hours needed to get the work done. But it's only a short-term burst. It's not sustaining in the long run. Mr. Ho, if you wake up and are Judge Ho, and I recognize that New York is a blue state, but imagine there is someone who considers himself or herself a conservative in the state of New York, who, God forbid, finds themselves in a courtroom where you're wearing a robe. What comfort do you think that litigant would have that you described the hatred of conservatives, the righteous indignation, the anger at conservatives, as a tremendous source of power for you personally. How does that possibly give anyone comfort that you would be a fair and impartial judge? Thank you, Senator Cruz, for giving me an opportunity to address this. Um, as I mentioned to some other members of the committee, this was a comment that I made in church where I was relaying a joke that someone else had told, the point of which was that that kind of temporary sugar rush from being angry at someone um, 
while it can feel powerful in a moment, it's not the kind of thing that is sustaining for a human being in the long run. That at the end of the day, if you want to do good work in the world, it has to come from a different place, a place of love for your fellow person. Um, and that's what I was trying to convey to my fellow congregants at my church. Well, that's not what you said. And, and what you said is you described hatred and righteous indignation directed at conservatives. And I would note that that's a pattern that also continues. You know, a minute ago, you talked about how you're dedicated to equality. And I will say, looking at your record, that is not, in fact, the case. Uh, your record, instead, is a partisan view. So, for example, you are a graduate of the Yale Law School. The Yale Law School has an open policy of discriminating against Asian Americans. One of the first things that Joe Biden's Justice Department did was dismiss the investigation against Yale because today's Democratic Party believes discriminating against Asian Americans in admissions is an acceptable form of bigotry. Do you agree with the Biden administration on that? Um, Senator Cruz, I, I haven't followed the ins and outs of what the Biden administration has done um, with respect to that particular matter. What, what I can tell you, Do I think- Do you agree with your alma mater's policy of discriminating against Asian, Amer uh, Asian Americans in admissions? Well, Senator Cruz, I I'm a member of the National Asian Pacific American Bar Association. I try to do what I can um, in the Asian American legal community. I I'm not aware of a particular policy of um, discrimination in admissions um, at Yale Law School. But I think to your larger question, Senator Cruz, I, I clerked for judges who were appointed by executives of different parties. Um, they set an example for me that politics, you can have political views, but they don't have a role on the bench. Um, and I would look to follow their examples. Well, your record suggests precisely the contrary. Thank you, Chairman Durbin, um, and thank you to all of today's nominees for your willingness to serve, for your records of service, and uh, to your families uh, for their support of your nominations here today. Um, with um, your forgiveness, I hope, uh, I'm going to focus uh, specifically on the nominee to be the head of the Patent and Trademark Office. Um, you've had a number of questions from my colleagues. I'm going to briefly address two or three things. Uh, there's lots of other issues I could take up, but I know that um, my uh, colleagues will uh, competently continue to engage in the concerns that uh, motivate many of us here on this committee. Uh, Ms. Vidal, if I might, just first congratulations on your nomination to this uh, important and challenging position. Um, I think it's crucial for us to have a patent and trademark office director who understands the values of patents uh, as a means of incentivizing innovation um, and who can advocate effectively uh, for balance, uh, for strong enforcement mechanisms, both domestically and internationally. Um, and if confirmed, I look forward to working with you. Um, this is an area that is of great interest to me and a number of other members of the committee on both sides, uh, but doesn't quite hold the attention of everybody uh, in our society and on our committee all the time. Um, I, I wanted to briefly talk to you about um, three issues, if I might. First, um, in December 2019, as you know, there was a joint USPTO, Department of Justice, NIST um, policy statement on standard essential patents. I think standard essential patents, uh, particularly in the current a world uh, in the ways in which technology is moving quickly and is developing are critical to innovation. Uh, and I support that uh, 2019 policy statement. I'm concerned there seems to be a move to reconsider it and possibly weaken it in terms of the remedies available. Would you commit to keeping an open mind uh, about whether any revisions to that 2019 statement are warranted? Absolutely. Uh, and would you commit to a transparent process that includes input from Congress and interested stakeholders if there is uh, any movement towards making changes? Uh, absolutely, Senator. Um, thank you. One of the things I'm most concerned about, and I know this um, brings together folks uh, both sides of the aisle, is state-sponsored IP theft, uh, particularly from China, but from many other competitors. Um, and international cooperation on intellectual property policy, I think, is a critical issue. Um, the previous administration at the PTO actively engaged the World Intellectual Property Organization and the International IP uh, Committee in what I thought was a critical move towards protecting IP rights. And so I think the next director has to continue to engage uh, with foreign partners 
um, that share our core values in order to ensure there's real multilateral cooperation on IP issues. Please tell um, me and this committee, if you would, briefly about your experience and your perspective on uh, the global uh, fight over IP protection. Th thank you, Senator Coons, for that very important question. Uh, part of the reason I'm here today is because of that activity. When I was asked whether I would be willing to serve in this position, I, I thought long and hard about whether I could make an impact and whether there was, there was progress to be made. I think there's a lot of progress we need to make on the international front. Um, there are, as, as you mentioned, there, there's theft going on. There are laws in other countries that are not transparent. Um, they're not predictable. Um, and it puts U.S. innovation at a disadvantage. Um, in, in terms of my own personal experience, I have, I have certainly represented U.S. industry against counterfeit goods, against infringing goods from other countries. Um, and and I, have a, I have a wealth of experience in that area and have found it very challenging when the laws are not balanced, when the laws are, laws are not fair and, and the laws are not equitable. So I would be very heavily engaged in that, uh, Senator. Well, I look forward to working with you on that. You've gotten questions from a number of my colleagues about Section 101, about patentability, um, about the FinTIF, uh, FinTIF factors and PTAB uh, initiation. Is there, is there anything remaining on those two areas that you'd like to speak to today before we conclude? Not on either of those two areas. I know that you know with 101, I would just say it, ne it needs more clarity, and I would look forward to working on that. Um, I think with Fintiv, um, it it's an issue that, that warrants additional consideration, and there are a lot of comments, and I would look forward to working with you on that as well. Okay. We've, we've got, in my view, a lot of work to do. Uh, I do think legislative reform is required in Section 101, and I think it's going to be very difficult, very elusive. And I think making sure that PTAB continues to strike the balance um, to protect um, strong patents, but to also provide a, a pathway towards review of improvidently granted patents is exactly one of the areas that I think uh, you may make a great contribution in. So, Mr. Chairman, with that, thank you. Um, Ms. Fidel, thank you. And to the other nominees, thank you. I look forward to supporting your confirmations. Thank you, Senator Cohen. Senator Blumenthal. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll be brief because a number of my other colleagues are waiting to ask questions, but I'd just like to say how impressed I am with not only the talent and dedication of this panel, but also the diversity. And uh, I am a former prosecutor myself. I was attorney general of my state for 20 years and the United States attorney in Connecticut, but I'm glad to see that we have the defense bar represented and uh, that the experience that you've had, life's experience that you'll bring to the bench is diverse as well. Um, I think one point that is often underestimated is the significance of temperament and perspective. On the district court, you will be the voice and face of justice for most Americans. Most litigants don't get to appeal the Court of Appeals, and when they do, they're often not there in person, and your temperament, your patience, uh, as you well know, because you have experience in the courts, will be tested many times by litigants. You've seen them, uh, but uh, I just want to congratulate uh, every one of you, and I look forward to your service on the bench. I'll be supporting all of you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Blumenthal. Senator Hirono. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to start by asking my two fundamental questions that I ask of every nominee before any of the committees on which I sit. So I will start with, and we'll just go right down the line, starting with Ms. Calvert. Since you became a legal adult, have you ever made unwanted requests for sexual favors or committed any verbal or physical harassment or assault of a sexual nature? No, Senator. No, Senator. No, Senator. No, Senator. No, Senator. Have you ever faced discipline or entered into a settlement relating to this kind of conduct? No, Senator. No, Senator. No, Senator. No, Senator. No, Senator. Thank you. As I've said here, uh, it's very clear that uh, my colleagues on the other side uh, have been um, attacking Mr. Ho, uh, portraying him as someone who can't be fair or impartial. In fact, I would, I would love to have judges who are fair and impartial, but uh, I want to note that uh, in my view and by my votes for judges over the four Trump years, we didn't have too many Trump nominees who fit that description of fairness and impartiality. 
That is my view. So for Mr. Ho, I just want to note for the record, Mr. Chairman, that uh, he has letters of support from individuals who state that he consistently treats people with impartiality and respect. Robert Smith, who you, he clerked for uh, on the New York Court of Appeals, was appointed by a Republican and is often considered conservative, wrote, quote, Dale has strong progressive convictions. This could easily have made for some tensions in our chambers, but it did not, not because Dale was shy in expressing his views, but because he knew how to do so appropriately and respectfully. In addition, 25 scholars and professors of elections law who, quote, believe in protecting the franchise for supporters of both political parties, quote, wrote, again quoting, Dale also has a right temperament for the bench. Many of us have had the pleasure of engaging with Dale in a variety of professional settings, and we know him to be a fair-minded interloc interloc can't even pronounce this, interlocutor, <laughs> even where we disagree with his views. Our experiences with Dale suggest to us that he will treat litigants with the respect and humility his position demands. When we talk about judicial temperament, um, I also, uh, this is the second time I'm noting that with regard to uh, now Justice Kavanaugh, there were over a thousand law professors and deans of law schools who wrote to this committee saying that he did not have the judicial temperament to be on the Supreme Court and there, and yet there he sits. I'm glad that we have uh, diversity on this panel and I do have a few questions for Ms. Vidal. Um, a report issued last year by the PTO found that women make up less than 13% of patent inventors. And other research suggests that racial minorities and other demographic groups are likewise underrepresented in the patent system. And if we want to maintain our status as the world's leading innovator, I think it's critical that we close these gaps and get more women and minorities involved in patenting. And this is why I worked with uh, Senator Tillis and others to introduce the IDEA Act, which directs the PTO to collect demographic information from patent applicants on a voluntary basis. And we'll need this data to understand who is patenting and who is not so we can address the problem. So the IDEA Act was included in the U.S. Innovation and Competition Act, and I hope that it is signed into law soon. Uh, if you're confirmed as PTO director, uh, would you commit to making sure that the IDEA Act is implemented in an effective and timely manner so that PTO can finally co uh, collect this critical data so that we can have a lot more women and minorities um, applying for patents and getting them. Uh, Senator, I, I appreciate that question. As I think you know, I feel as deeply, maybe not as deeply, but I feel very deeply about those issues. And uh, the answer is in the affirmative. Yes, I, uh, yes, I will. I think that we are going to have to make a, um, a concerted efforts because you know, we, the, the, uh, we're not gonna have minorities and women uh, going for patents uh, if we don't make these kinds of um, uh, efforts. It's not gonna just happen because we think it's a great idea. Uh, with regard to diversity to the patent bar, I want to tell the story of Sarah Blakely, the inventor of Spanx, who talks about how hard it was for her to find a patent attorney to help her uh, prosecute what, what, what has proven to be a billion dollar invention and all the male patent attorneys she went to basically thought it was a big joke. And finally when she found a female um, patent attorney then she was able to patent the Spanx and now is a, is a billionaire. So we need to do more to uh, make sure that the patent bar itself encourages uh, diversity. And I hope that you would um, also commit to that. I will, Senator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Senator Booker. I really appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief. Uh, the panel has been there for a long time. Uh, I would just really like to um, uh, ask a question, Mr. Ho, if you don't mind, sir. Um, despite the law school that you attended, uh, I have a lot of respect for you and your career, and I want to thank you for the work you've done to protect uh, the essential rights of our democracy. Uh, as I looked into your career, you have shown an ability to work on both sides of the aisle, represent people regardless of race, religion, or political belief, and it's pretty extraordinary. Um, I'll read uh, this because I think it's important. Uh, that you worked uh, to protect the rights of people uh, on both sides of the aisle, in one case in particular, if I have it right, Hotez versus Hollins, is that correct? 
uh, you filed a challenge on behalf of Texas voters whose ballots uh, election officials tried to disqualify because they were cast at a drive through voting site. Uh, some of the voters you represented in this lawsuit included voters who routinely voted Republican. Another example of your balanced approach uh, to the law is the amicus brief that you filed on behalf of five Republican voters in Maryland who brought a lawsuit, and if I pronounce this right, Benziak versus Lamone? I think it's Benisek, Senator. Thank you very much. I went to Yale Law School. It's difficult sometimes for me to read. Um, uh, they, this case was um, uh, challenging a congressional redistricting map that would have manipulated the electoral outcome in favor of Democrats. Uh, in fact, I have a letter here from the attorney who brought that suit. Uh, Michael Kimberly is the co-editor of, editor of the Yale Law Supreme Court Clinic, and he writes, quote, Mr. Ho's amicus engagement in this case and his support of our plaintiffs reflects a genuine concern for the rule of law without regard for the politics of our plaintiffs. I believe that this type of open-mindedness, freedom from bias, and commitment to equal justice is exactly the kind of temperament we need for the court. Uh, I have a lot of respect for you, and I know that this has not been an easy hearing, um, but I don't have a question. I just have an affirmation that the totality of your record reflects your heart and your spirit, and I believe uh, you will make an extraordinary judge. Um, and I just want to say in closing, because my friend John Ossoff has something in common with you. You both are appallingly young. Um, but uh, I just want to say to all the people on the panel, um, I, I rejoice in your diversity. I rejoice in your diversity of experiences. I'm excited about how you will help to uphold the law and the rule of law and the best of who we are as Americans. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Booker. Senator Ossoff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Congratulations again uh, for your nominations and thank you for your willingness to serve for putting your families through this uh, difficult process. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for so ably managing this hearing. I have letters of support from law enforcement officials, members of the legal community who have litigated both alongside and against the two Georgia nominees uh, and other community leaders that I'd like to enter into the record. Uh, and with that, I would yield the remainder of my time. Well, thank you, Senator Rossoff, for being sensitive to what the panel has set through uh, for the last hour or more. And I thank you all for being here. Uh, I want to say a word uh, Mr. Ho, because you seem to be the focus of a lot of attention, and uh, this, it has been noted, and I want to make sure it's part of the record, this letter from Robert Smith of the firm of Friedman and Kaplan. Uh, it appears that Mr. Smith was formerly uh, a judge for the New York Court of Appeals, and that you uh, were his clerk for two years. He has good things to say about you, but he addresses one issue that came up specifically. Uh, he said, uh, not because Dale was shy in expressing his views, but he knew how to do it appropriately and respectfully, according to Judge Smith. He goes on to say, he's not one of those people of whom there are too many today who think of members of a different political tribe as the enemy. If he were, I don't think he would have clerked for me and remained my friend since. Mr. Smith had made the point that he was appointed by a Republican. Then he goes on to say, courtesy to everyone is a hallmark of Dale's character. Of course, most law clerks are polite to the judges they work for, but I observed Dale was equally courteous to his colleagues, court staff, and homeless people who approached him on the street to ask for money. I think his sense of the innate worth and dignity of every human being and his ability to behave accordingly will serve him in good stead in a trial courtroom. One of the occupational hazards of a judge is a tendency to behave like a petty tyrant. I can assure you that will not happen with Dale Ho. Powerful, and I'm glad I want to make it officially part of the record. And as for the conclusion of one of the senators on the other side, that he's worried that your passion evidences an anger, which suggests you may not have a judicial temperament. Um, I will tell you, each of us has a different temperament uh, and different personality, but uh, each of us usually has an issue that raises our passions to a certain level. For me, it's the issue of immigration. 20 years ago, I introduced the DREAM Act. I've been trying for 20 years to pass a law to protect these young people brought to the United States by their parents who simply want to be part of America's future. I've gone to the floor of the Senate over 125 times with color photographs of these dreamers. 
to tell their desperate stories, searching for an opportunity to become part of America. And yes, I have been angry, and yes, I have been passionate, and yes, I don't apologize one damn bit. That is something that I feel very intensely about. I will be respectful to those who oppose me, but I feel passionately about the people I've sent, been sent to represent. I think each of us has the similar life experience. So that concludes this hearing, and I thank my colleagues for uh, being here through the, uh, the whole, um, most of it. And I would just say that there may be written questions sent your way. I hope you'll respond quickly because we want to uh, try to move your nominations forward if we can. Uh, i make a quick logistical note. Questions for the record will be due to nominees by 5 p.m. on Wednesday, December 8. The record will likewise remain open until the time uh, that time to submit letters and similar materials. And with that, the hearing's adjourned. I thank all the family members for their patience as well.